Right, today is the 31st of August 2023. Um, we're in Leeds today um, to talk to two very, very prominent members of Bradford's Afro-Caribbean community. Um, we have Richard Bingy Brown and we have Victor Wedderburn. So guys, thank you very much for your time today. Um, it's very well appreciated. Bingy, thank you for providing the venue, uh, which was very important as well, and um, hence why we're in Leeds. And today, following on from our last interview with Maurice Powell and Patrick Lennon about the Afro-Caribbean community in Bradford, this is part two about the Afro-Caribbean community in Bradford with two totally different members of the community that have different experiences and can provide a valuable insight into the Afro-Caribbean community in Bradford, which The Voice has described as an invisible community and is not as visible as it used to be back in the day. And we will touch upon that. Okay, so, um, guys, I hear that back in the day, Manningham had a vibrant Afro-Caribbean community, plenty of businesses, plenty of black clubs, a front line which consisted of the Young Lions Cafe, the Perseverance Pub and the Bookies, a very lively front line. Um, so guys, I wanted to just start off this interview with your memories of the Young Lions Cafe and the front line and the general Manningham area, what it was like back in the day. But before I do that, I would like to, as I always do with my interviews, ask you each to introduce yourself. So, Bingy. Yeah, like I said, my name is Bingy. Um, I'm a person who has lived and grown up in Bradford for many years. Until 2012 when I moved back to Jamaica. I was actually born in in Doncaster, but we started to travel back to Jamaica from my teens. And for my father in love with the country, I never stayed, I mean, stayed far away from there. So. Yeah. My name is Victor. I was born in Jamaica, Mandeville. I came to England when I was 16. 16? Yeah. What year did you come? 71. 71, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I went to school in Bradford, um, lived in Manningham when I left home, and I still live in Manningham. I went to Birmingham for a while uh -huh. in the late, late 80s, uh -huh. mid 80s. Uh -huh. um, I spent five years there, came back, early 90s. Yeah. But before I went to Bradford, to Birmingham, I was working as a truck driver uh -huh. at Crofts in Bradford. Yeah. Got made redundant 82. Uh -huh. uh, I still lived in Manningham then. Yeah. Um, and I decided to buy a camera. Yeah. Some colour developing equipment. Mm -hmm. And from then on, yeah. I was visiting the front line nearly every day. Yeah, so I'm going to touch on your photographic record of the front line, which is so, so important. So, so important that even the city council use some of your photographs to promote and tout to um, qualify for winning the award of Bradford, UK City of Culture, Bradford 2025. So, thank you very much for your introduction.
So I want to um, obviously go back to the first question, which is your memories of Manningham back in the day, your memories of the front line and, you know, what it was like back in Manningham, the Manningham which is so different to what it is now. Oh, sir. From, my point, from my point of view, I was, um, I was what you could describe back in ideas as a, a street youth. A street uh, youth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from an early age, I used to frequent the Green Lane Youth Club. Um, I'm from the Green Lane Youth Club. You automatically progress from growing up onto the front line. Uh -huh. Back in them days, it was kind of funny because when you was young, the older heads used to kick you up your backside and say, Go on, yeah, what are you doing up here? Okay. So yeah, uh, the old the older people. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a case where when we was young, we used to go up there. Yeah. But when it reached a certain time, some of the older heads them we used to say, "Listen, where are up here? Go, um, go." Um. My my member of the front line. It was a place when I was in my teens, young teens. Uh -huh. um, even younger than that as well. Probably about even eleven when we used to go to Green Lane. 12, 13, and go to Green Lane and we take our cheeky self and go pass through the front line because obviously you used to hear about the front line and that's where all the older heads there used to be. Yeah. So, so this is the 70s you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we used to pass there and sometimes we just used to walk past. We never used to go into the cafe, uh -huh. but we used to just walk past. And back then, the, um, the pub was there. I think it was the Percy. The Percy Park. Yeah. If I'm not wrong, Victor might can remember more than me. I'm not sure if Shirley used to run it in mm. at that time. Was it Shirley who run it? Yeah, yeah, Shirley did for a while, but then. I thought that was near near the end. Is that was it? Okay. So um, we used to pass there. We couldn't go into the Percy. We couldn't go into the young guy, but because of the excitement, we used to just pass up there. Mm. And. Um, to me, I, I always remember it was very, very exciting just to even pass there and mm. the, 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 um, the vibes that was on the, up there was something different to, to what we was used to as youngsters. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, we used to go to the Green Lane um, Youth Club. Mm. Um, but I didn't really start going to the Young Lions properly Yeah. until I'd probably say I was a pastor on there, I probably was about 15, 16. So the reason why I can remember that mm. is because I passed my test when I was 16 year old and ah. the person who used to teach me was a white guy and he used to come onto the um, lane to buy weed. Uh -huh. So um, I used to take my, test, uh, my lessons then with him. So um, I Drive, passed my test. Driving? Yeah. Driving. He was a driving instructor, you know, All right. a white guy. Yeah. So um, so yeah, so I I, I think we used to, I was a frequent up there when probably about fourteen fifteen. Yeah, yeah. Them time there. Yeah, yeah. And what was it? What could you see on the front line? Where there's always groups of guys hanging outside. It was it kind of. No, but it, the the vibes within what people call the front line mm -hmm. and the Afro Caribbean community in in any city that you go to mm. is that especially around summertime mm. most people would be outside mm. um and over the years the front um, the front line got a name because people used to come from all over the place mm. to frequent um there for various various um things but mm. I just remember it being like a community place where we could go sit down listen music mm. you used to have certain man who used to have they car with the biggest um, <laughs> sound system on their motor. As you can remember, Sleepy, yeah, yeah. Um, Gregory, um, Scooch. Mm -hmm. um, there was various people who used to have the sound system. Mm. In their cars. In, the in the cars. cars and yeah, right, they used right. to come and park it up and open the doors. and. And, and that was the vibe, it was just a nice, nice environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I used to drive a truck that time, so yeah. any spare time I have. I go, if I go to Keatley and 
skipped and then places like that, delivery mm. and stuff. Mm. When I finish, instead of going back to work, I pass by the front line. Yeah. So I park my truck and, and just, just like, chill out there. It's like yard, isn't it? It's yeah, like, yeah. It's the only place you see black people outside. Mm. And in like the summertime, a, you know, just, yeah. just chill outside. I, I chill. And for those people who aren't familiar with the front line, everything was in a 50-yard 50 50 yard line, yeah. basically, because you had on one side the Young Lions Cafe, in between you had the Perseverance Pub, then you had the Bookies at the other end. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, and Green Lane was behind the Bookies, so everything was in a short space, and everyone was congregated on that short space of Lime Lane, Lum Lane, which was called the Front Line. There's a cobble road next to the pub, between uh -huh. the pub and the bookies. Yeah. Uh, an old cobble road. It's, it's a dead end at the top. Yeah. So people would go to the top, park the cars around there. Uh -huh. And like Binky said, the stereo would be on. Mm. Somebody would be playing some music. Yeah. And so you just lean on people's cars, lean on the walls, just and, chill yeah, around there. So it must have been a really electric, vibrant it's, it's, atmosphere yeah. well, as captured in your photographs. Yeah, 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 yeah. photographs were taken there. I was going to say that even some of the pictures where he has, which I have seen, mm. that just projects exactly yeah. how it used to be. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's what it was like back in the day. So what was the... Um, I mean, in, back in those days, the uh, Manningham area, I mean, now the Manningham area is predominantly Pakistani, whereas back in the day, there was a, more of a Caribbean community in Manningham, yes? Yeah, there was Pakistanis there as well then, Yeah, but they were past... It was a uh, mixture, it was yeah. a mixture, mixed community yeah. back in those days. Yeah. At the same time, when I was there, I, rem I remember a couple of... Um, um, Pakistani virgins who used to actually come and play pool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, come and pass through mm. bonus spliff same yeah. way mm. and um I relax it was no problem. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was a multicultural place, anyone could yeah. frequent. Um and um in those days there was a lot more of Caribbean families in that area. Yeah, because I was brought up I used to I used to um, live on Wetley Lane, yeah. uh -huh. which is a walking distance from Green Lane. Uh -huh. And um, before that, I used to live on Oak Lane, which again is what is a walking dis in distance. Mm. So um, back in my memory is even up to um, as far as Wetley Lane, mm. there was. A, there was a black community around there. Right. Um, Salt Lane, come down Oak Lane, mm. onto Lum Lane, yeah. Green Lane area. Mm. Um, there was always a, I can remember, a vibrant um, black community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, with that, I mean, I heard that the, a lot of families, a road was destroyed to make way for I don't know what. Um, so a lot of Caribbean families were moved out of the area. Do you remember that in the seventies? You know something. From, yeah, I think um, what I remember is a lot of people. I've, I'd be I'd be wrong to say at the time if I can say this is the reason. We just know that probably a lot of people ended up moving towards Manchester Road. Yeah, Manchester Road, West <laughs> Bowling area. Are you talking about the flats on Green Lane? Well, I'm talking about, I heard in the 70s that the, a, ro a road or some roads were demolished because the properties, I've been told, were not fit for habitation or something. Um, or that they were building an A road which was never eventually built. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, one or more roads was destroyed in Manningham and a lot of Caribbean families who lived in that area were kind of like uh, had to uh, had to move elsewhere i i i got that in the 70s in the 70s I, I i i don't i i don't really remember i was i, I was in my young teens in the 70s so i can't say that i yeah. can actually remember mm. if that was the mm. case i can't even directly remember exactly when a lot of people even started to move out of um mm. But I know it happened. I think that was, I, I know about the 80s when the the flats at Green Lane 
the green bal- lane had, which was around the corner from the, the front. Yeah. Plane. Yeah. The balconies fell off, didn't they? Off, off one of them. Uh huh. And so they, instead of repairing the balconies, they decided to take them down. Didn't they? Well, they okay. moved some okay. people out. So a lot of people again moved out to yeah. the area because yeah. of that. So with this vibrant area, you know, you've got the front line. What was the police's attitude when they saw everyone just enjoying themselves together in groups? The police, were they kind of, what was their attitude towards the front line? What was the police interaction and how did they police? Every front line, if you go around the UK, has different policing methods. What was the police's attitude towards the front line in Manningham back in the day when it was up and running? It, It was all sneaky. Undercover, mostly. Undercover? Yeah. So you had a lot of undercover surveillance? Yeah. The school, there was a school opposite the cafe. Do you remember that? Yeah. And it had a bell tower. Hmm. Like, with, like green... Uh, like a, a tall tower? Yeah, taller than okay, the Okay, I can remember. If you're not wrong, there was a couple of times that would, we used to be up there that time. But them tired, and they used to say that it's the police. School, yeah. They could see pol- people inside the school. In the bell tower. This is the mm. derelict building, you know? yeah. yeah. Looking, up, looking over yeah. and taking pictures. And that used to also happen in, in the flat side. He's a governor road right in front of the thing, mm. in, um, in front of the young lion. Mm. I know a couple of times people used to say that. Um, they Some of the see. pictures that they used to be take, that used to be taken and was shown to them. Yeah. When certain people would get in charge or whatever, is you could tell that it was actually coming from the school area, like yeah. you, Victor said. Yeah. And from Governor Road, from a property. So you the police. But in, in, in all due respect, no, it doesn't really make no difference where you are in England when it comes to. A front I've, line. I've never mm. actually been there when they do a raid. Mm. I've, I've, never, actually, I, I've never been there when, the, when it's been well, raided. They don't, they don't normally raid the place. Yeah, they just keep an eye out. Yeah, and what happens is somebody will buy a drop mm. and on his way home they'll stop him. Okay. And say, who did you buy it from? Describe who sell you it. Yeah. That's how they get to find out who the dealers are. Mm, mm. I think that, only a, yeah, I think a lot of them, like Victor said, that if I without interruption, is that they'd watch. That's why you know that it was actually surveilling the place because the, the thought that I used to get is that a lot of the people that used to come and buy the weed, mm. when they used to drive away or walk away, they used to get stuck. They get stuck. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So obviously there's somebody watching somewhere. Mm, no, of course. We'll let you off if you tell us we sold it. We'll sold mm. it. This area, I grew up in this area from the age of 14. First place I land when I come to England, yes? I don't know anywhere else. This is more or less my roots in England, yeah? This is the only foothold black people have in the land. This is our front line. You know what I mean? We're not really doing it. You know what I mean? This is the only place we have to go. Everybody sort of meets up here, really, don't we? We all meet up here. It's just the place, really. They're, they're taking down the clubs. They're yeah. taking the clubs away from us. There's yeah. nowhere else we can Me go. Flower. That's why everybody exactly. comes That's here. That's why everybody comes here. <laughs> but who's going to put it across? We're nobody. I'm nobody. I'm a piece of rubbish off the floor. Me, I stood there and told them that. They don't know nothing. I know. When you grow up in this community and you see a, a woman with four or five kids, yeah, um, nothing to wear, 
etc., struggling, it's not a nice sight. So at the end of the day, a woman who goes out there, yeah, knowing that she's got dependence on her, and she's prepared to go out there and sacrifice her body, which she's, which she's doing, sacrifice herself, um, I've got a lot of respect for them kind of women. No, I'm speaking, man, because I've got to speak. Right, as far as I'm concerned, right, everyone's got a choice to do what they want to do. No one forced anyone to do anything, right, round here or anywhere. All those girls out there are out there by choice. No one sends them to do it. It's money they're after, and it's money they want. That's why they go out there. People get in trouble for marijuana. And people get in trouble for the eye jokes. So if they're going to get in trouble for the law jokes, they might as well go and take the eye jokes. Honestly, marijuana, you know, black, bush, weed, that sort of stuff, they should bring out legal. If they bring that out legal, I think things will change. They will. Everybody will cool down and they won't take the heavy drugs then, do you know what I mean? That's why they take the heavy drugs, do you know what I mean? That's why if they bring that shit out, bloody legal, things will change. So what was, the, I mean, I never actually got to go into the Young Lions Cafe. The closest I ever got was in 2002 when it had clothes and it had the black and white writing on a bollard on the black, mm -hmm. on the Young Lions. Even then, after it closed, I still saw three men standing outside by the alleyway. It was still the place. What was it like inside then? Um, yeah, what was the, you had obviously a pool table, yeah. you had a television, you had um, obviously an upstairs room, um, so and you had food there and everything. So it was just a kind of just a, a hangout place, really. Yeah, well, it, like I said, it was the um, the Young Line Cafe. Mm. So obviously there were food rules to sell there. Mm. They used to play pool. My rules to just come and meet, sit down, reason yeah. all yeah. kind of topics. I can tell you, yeah. if you want to find out. It, it, if we had a record and back in them days, some of the conversations which used to take place in the on the different topics and issues and mm. and the different people inside there we could save the world yeah and put the, um, all the problems to one side and deal with them yeah, yeah. They, used to, they used to sit down and reason about everything yeah. obviously they used to like, upstairs they used to have like um, dominoes dominoes card pack. Yeah. Upstairs. And but not mostly, everyone was allowed upstairs, only the regulars. I can't, I can't remember if it, if it was a regular, as I said, that you're not allowed well, any, to go Anyone up could go upstairs. It wasn't, it wasn't like top secret, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody could go upstairs. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. there were no interests really. If you, if they, depends who they are. Mm. You know, people only go up to look for somebody. Yeah, yeah. 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 Unless you were directly going to play dominoes or yeah. cards, then yeah. you're not you're not going up there. Like me to say, if you look for somebody, then you might yeah. go up there. Yeah. yeah. But I, I can never remember anybody saying you can't go up there. Yeah. Mm. I can back in the days, I can't remember anybody saying no, no, you're not allowed to go up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was a buzzing place, but Victor, you remember sometimes the police used to search people as well in or around the cafe? Not, not, not really there on the front line. Yeah. But if you're in town, for instance, yeah. Uh, in the 70s, when police would stop, stop and search. Yeah. And a lot of people would get done for sus if, if they want to frame you. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. They had the sus law. Yeah. Sus is, I couldn't believe it, I couldn't understand it. Mm. So I was working, I was driving a truck. Yeah. I started I started when I was 19 mm. driving a truck yeah. until I was 28. Yeah. So my friends, I'd be going home to bed 10 o'clock because mm. I'm working, I start at 8 in the morning. But my friends, I have to tell them to go home if they're at my house. Because mm. I have to go to sleep. I'm going to work. They just partying. They'd be out all night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Mm. And my friends were broke. My wage was 26, 27, to about 30, depends on overtime. Yeah. That my top wage would be 30 pounds uh -huh. a week. Yeah, yeah. Back Before in the times. 70s. Yeah. And my friends are signing on. Yeah. So they would come to my house in the evening trying to borrow my car. Oh. Those days you drive <laughs> drive old cars, you know. Yeah, yeah. Fix it myself. Mm -hmm. I did all my mechanic in. Mm. Then you know, so people would try and borrow your car and 
to go mm. to Leeds Blues and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I did sometimes, stupidly. Mm. And mm. they just, you know. Um, but I was going to sleep. They'd be out trying to hustle. I don't want to say they hustle. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it was it was hard times for black people. Mm. Mm. And I knew I was lucky that I had a job. Yeah. All my friends didn't have a job. Uh huh. You know, clues. And why could they not find what, what you know. was, was there a lot of uh, racial prejudice in a colour bar yeah. when people went for jobs back in the 70s? I found out uh, uh, late 70s that the only reason I had a job was because the government at the time made a rule that you had to employ uh, people with mental handicap, people with people of different races. Yeah. Because before that, they, they didn't like you, you don't get a job. It wasn't so much qualification, it was about, mm. you know, employ somebody with physical problems, mm. mental mm. problems, mm. And, race, and races. Yeah. And I think so, so you were a tick, basically people use you as a tick box. In to fact, say, we've done our bit, you've got the yeah. job. Yeah. 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 So basically, back in LMDs, days, that was coming as for black people. Yeah. Racial discrimination, racial prejudice, mm. and stereotyping when it comes to employment. Mm. I personally, I can tell people, say, I never had a nine to five job. Not, not many people. Not many I people never had a nine to five job mm. until 2022. Right. That wow. was my first nine, to, and that is a job what I am doing now. I'm an education inclusion mentor, right. and that was my first nine to nine five. To five. Job. I have never ever worked for, and one of the reasons why, because like Victor just highlighted, back in the days when I was when I was sixteen, which would have been nineteen eighty, hmm. um, when we used to um, go look job back then, there was me, Bob Luck, um, school children, yeah. white mice, so Bud, Neville Coyote. That's who I was. Um, we used to move around with back in the um, mm. days when at, at 14, 15, 16, 17, mm. up to them kind of early age. And it was hard to find a job if even back then you, want, you wanted to go mm. find a job because you didn't want for earn money. Yeah. So it was hard. So my, my mental um, thinking back then was. I'm not, I'm not going to look no job because you just got fed up of being refused. Mm. As I'm saying, I walk on in. Plus, I was uh, at 60 when I leave school, I started to do, I started to go do my locks before I even leave school. You, you became a Rastafarian. Yeah. yeah. With, um, well, I, I used to read up and, and practice Rastafari even before I leave school, but I put on my locks. Mm. When I, soon I was, as I know, I was coming up to leave school, I started to do So to when you were a teenager, you grew your dreadlocks and you knew back in the 70s yeah. that that was a hindrance to getting a job. Well, imagine a black man back in them days, it was going to be a hindrance. So a black young youth with dreadlocks, dreadlocks yeah. is double jeopardy. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. That is, that is the place. I'd come home from school, mm -hmm. I'd come home from work and, 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 and on television there'd be South Africa in the news. Yeah. Anti apartheid. We we were well apartheid. Yeah. And we'd be staring at telly just getting vexed. Mm. How can they, you know? Um mm. and it's it's reasons like that really mm. when I started locking up because So you actually used to have dreadlocks yeah, as well, Victor, yeah. 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 But I wasn't like the colours, I was just vexed. This was like, you know, if because uh, the people I work with as well, they didn't like it. Mm. So when they talk about redundancy, I was all for it because I was just fed up with the people. And that's and your redundancy that led to your photographic work as well. Yeah. So let's touch on, at the moment the front line is still there and we are going to touch on the eventual closure of the front line and the clubs. While the front line is still bubbling, it's at a time where you've been made redundant. Yeah. 
and that's when your photographic career and your all-important photos of the front line started. Yeah. So do you want to go into a bit of how that started then? I think you touched upon it at the beginning, but I wanted to explore it a bit more now. You know, because now's the right time when you've obviously been made redundant. Yeah. yeah. And little bits of money redundancy pay off. So, my girlfriend at the time, fiancé, mm. um, had a friend in Leeds who did colour photographs. Right. And I never seen colour photographs. I had, a, I had a friend who did black and white. Yeah. And I've seen that process, mm. even though I didn't understand it properly. Mm. But I was intrigued with the colour. So I, and, and she said, he, he wants to sell it, he doesn't need it, he doesn't use it. Mm. So imagine this, it's used, he got fed up with it, put it away. Yeah. So he doesn't remember the process. Yeah. The manual he's got is ripped up. It's got developing fluid spilled on it. Yeah. So I'm trying to learn to, you know, to open these pa these pages and trying to learn mm. how it works. Mm. And obviously, a lot of it was guesswork because mm. um, it had to be in pure darkness, total darkness. You can't use a, a red light like mm. people do with black and white. Yeah. So you're learning how to develop the photographs. Yeah. And the first one came out. Uh, the colours was a mess, but. I kept on. My first thing in the dark room was about 22 hours. Wow. You know, and I'm falling asleep, so. <laughs> and I, I produced three photographs that mm. was. The colours was, wasn't right, mm. but instead of, rather than reading and learn, I was just wasting paper going through the process. And, mm until I understand how it works, how, how long, and there's temperature, time, and yeah, temperature yeah. and the time, mm. it, it's very important. Mm. So if you, you can overdevelop or underdevelop, yeah. and that's it, ruin. Mm. So, and, and obviously I'm, it, I was lucky with the negatives, mm. most of my negatives came out okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which is important because without good negatives, you don't get photographs. Yeah. Yeah. So, because I had good negatives, I had I could I could make mistakes and learn. Mm. But more importantly, the reason why I brought up your redundancies, you took up photography as an income, as well, a I job thought, to I make thought, an income. Yeah, I thought I could. I thought once I master this, I'll be making money. Okay. Right, but, yes. and so obviously, I was just drawn to the front line automatically. So you took the, all those all important pictures of the front line. Yeah. Um, Bingy, I think you're in a few of those photographs as well. Um, yeah. You See, remember Victor taking photographs? Yeah, on the front line? I, I tell you, there was two people who used to go up there and take pictures all the time. There was Victor, mm. and there was um, Lanry. Lanry. Lanry Fehentola. Lanry. Yeah. He used to come up there and take pictures all the while. Mm. Um, if I'm not wrong, I'm sure most of Larry's pictures were black and white. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. he only yeah. did black and white. Yeah. Oh, is that what he wanted? Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah. I remember, I can remember distinctly him taking pictures and we used to look at some of them and it was in black and, mm. black and white. Mm. So, yeah. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be he, interesting. He was doing it for art. He thought, he yeah. said, Art. He was doing it for art, but yeah. you took up we, photography when you got made redundant to, because, as an income. Yeah, I thought I could develop photographs and sell them. I even found somebody to make frames for me. Yeah. And um, so I'd buy the frames, uh, buy the paper, the developing fluid. Mm. And I, I used to do two sizes. Mm. 8 by 10, yeah. 16 by 12. Uh -huh. So 16 by 12 is big. Didn't sell many of them because mm. they were supposed to go up on the walls. Okay, yeah. But yeah. 8 by 10, you can sit on your dresser, on your fireplace. Yeah, yeah, it's a good yeah. size. Yeah. So did you kind of, I mean, you took loads of group pictures and we're so thankful that you did. But w because were, were, people, no... were you making your money from the group pictures mainly or no, were people no. asking for portraits? No. In fact, if I'd taken more of the group, 
there would be that would be even better now mm. you know but my, really I was taking photographs of people yes and I would ask them do you want do you want me to take your photographs yeah you know, and, and agree a price with them yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but the group is I just thought they made good pictures yeah yeah no, of course and, and I, I preferred it when people didn't pause. Yeah, you wanted a natural... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And by chance, I got a good few like well, that. Well, you did. I mean, you got pictures outside the Young Lions Cafe in the mid-80s, yeah. pictures outside the Perseverance pub, pictures outside the betting shop. Well, and so yeah. The, outside the shop, there's nobody there, really, mm -hmm. in and out. Mm -hmm. But on Lum Lane side of the betting shop, yeah. which is like a alleyway wasn't there yeah and there's a wall so people would like go sit in the down. bookies buy the ticket yeah come back out and sit on the lum lane side yeah yeah so i got one of people one or two of them yeah on, yeah on that, and, and it's yeah. and it's through your photography we have that record of the front line without that yeah. record of the front line and they um, would just people they wouldn't just, know what it was like yeah. i just thought they make good pictures yeah you know and there, there was no money in that, in those. Mm. The money came from, like, I took a few people, like, they say, come to a house, mm. pictures of the babies. Yeah. Um, I even got one where she wanted pictures of her dogs, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and that's where I thought I'd make money. But mm. people were poor, you know. Mm. And it's a luxury. Yeah. That no, kind of, of photograph. So yeah, yeah. When I said to them, I used to print the negatives. Yeah. I have like a, a, a board that you put your negatives in. Yeah. And I would print them. Mm. I would take the negatives to people and say, tick which one you want. Yeah, yeah. And then so, I, yeah. And, and um, so you did this for about a year, is that correct? You, you didn't do about, it for years about, on end? No, about two years. Two I years, yeah. two years. Okay. All together. Yeah. So then, obviously, mid-80s, 85, 86, you moved from Bradford and you moved to, to Birmingham. Yeah. So, Bingy, it was around that time or was it before that you, obviously, this, there was talk about black clubs slowly closing down, people moving out of the area. Um, I think, obviously, there was a gradual closing of Afro-Caribbean meeting places. Do you want to touch on what, your, what you noticed um, when that started happening? About what year, what year are we talking about here? Well, kind of when it started. I mean, we talked about uh, Victor, because, Victor, um, because in, in 84. The, well, in the 80s, mm. I think everything was around back in, the, in them times. In the, in the 80s, I turned 16 in 1980. Yeah. So 84, 20. But then I was going to Mayflower. Uh -huh. I was. That's the only place I used to go. Mayflower on Manningham Lane. Mm -hmm. Mayflower. Yeah. Um, the Percy. Perseverance Pub, yeah. Yeah. We used to go um, to them two particular places. Uh -huh. and go blues. Uh, as a young. As a. As a a young adult in my late teens, I was very adventurous. Yeah. And the people um, who I used to go around with, we was kind of adventurous. So mm. we used to go to the area a lot. We used to go to London a lot. Uh -huh. But then they used to have a London sun splash. We used to go to Carnival. Yeah. London Carnival a lot. Mm. Mm. We used to go to Nang Nottingham, which was, um, they used to have a blues in, at, Tell how we used to hmm. rave. London, sorry, Nottingham on Monday. Yeah. Sheffield was Tuesday. Uh -huh. We used to go to turnips. Uh -huh. um, Wednesday, Thursday, hmm. Friday hmm. was regular, which was perseverance. Then just walk down the road or drive down the road if you hmm. drive into Percy. Hmm. Sorry to Mayflower. Mayflower yeah. And then after the Mayflower we used to just drive down to the sunlight. Yeah. Which was Parker Cafe. So, yeah, mm. Parker. Um cafe. And then from the cafe we sit down we sit down, eat some food and from there it was just to find blues. 
Yeah. Um, so in the 80s, there was, I'd say there was many things around. Was a lot, wasn't there? there was yeah. many things in, in, the, in, in the 80s, definitely. Because mm. there, was, there, there was Palm Cove. Yeah. There was the Mayflower. Yeah. There was sugar cane. Back then, I think the sugar cane had moved from at the end of Green Lane, uh -huh. and it moved to the corner of Lum Lane. Mm. Not Lum Lane, Tala Lane. Tala Lane, yeah. The corner. Lane. Yeah, the top of Tala Lane. Mm. Um, in town, back in the eighties, I'm not sure when it closed. Victor might know. Mm. Was it Black Diamond? Oh no, that's early. That was seventies black diamond course. So what what did they have used to have? Is it Afros? What the rest? The, well, in what the, 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 the seventies the there was Afro and black diamond. Yeah. Mm. And where and was then, Afros? Then, was Afros near Afro, the um? Alhambra, just up the road from. Um, can't remember what the road's called now, but. Afro, you you go you go past the Alhambra coming up. Yeah, I, I we never frequent them places. Mm. I, I never I never used to go to I never yeah I never used to go to Both. places like Black Diamond mm. or Diamond. I yeah. didn't go to Afros. Mm. Afro closed yeah. way back early seventies. Mm. I used to remember my mother um, and other people used to talk about um, mm -hmm. Diamond, Black Diamond, mm. and Afros. Mm. Yeah, them them two them two was like. They closed in the mid seventies. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, and Victor, what what clubs and places did you used to frequent? I've been to both Afro and and um, Black Diamond. Yeah. But rarely on the weekends when I could afford to go out. Oh, okay. you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And what was the blues scene? We never. I mean, in my first interview, we never talked about the blues party scene in Bradford. Name and. Obviously, describe where the f most famous and most frequented blues parties. And if it's got people to watching this don't know what a blues where? party is, it's got to be Farkliff. Farkliff. yeah, I mean, blues party. Well, explain. There's going to be a lot of people who are watching this and they have no experience of what a blues or a shabine is. So, do you want to first of all, before you go into the Bradford shabine or blues scene, you want to describe to the people who are a bit green behind the ears when it comes to this what a blues or what a well, shabine back in the days, it was hard for us to find places to go to after a certain time mm. and because of racism and you used to have the national front you used to have the skinheads you used to have the issues actually in town so we didn't frequent town so you never to used to go into the town center to no, discotheques no no no, no, yeah, no yeah, not I, really. I went to i went to pubs in town you went to pubs I, 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 when, when I, this this is this is early 70s early 70s early mid 70s Sometimes you move from the pub to Afro. Yeah. Or Black Diamond. Okay. And after them two clothes, there's nowhere in town for black people then. Mm. So we'd start looking at blues. Blues. Just otherwise go home yeah, at yeah, 11 yeah, o'clock. Yeah. So you, it, 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 very rare there were blues in Bradford. A lot of people used to go to Leeds. Yeah. So so Bingy, you, you, but you, that, that might have been in in this yeah. era. But from what from I can recollect, from from I was I was going to blues before yes. I was allowed to before I was allowed to go blues. <laughs> and I'm saying, to be quite honest, yeah. if my mother was to be watching this now, she'd be saying, okay, because what I was to do, I was about four, fourteen year old, fifteen year old. Yeah, I I used to live at Sloan Square then back in them days. Sloan Square. Yeah. yeah. So um, with going. Because we um, weekend going, wait till my mother got um, to bed, and we <laughs> used to seriously we used to jump out of the um, leave the kitchen window open. Yeah. Yeah. Don't yeah. go through the door because I was afraid that she would hear. So I open the kitchen window, and then leave that, and then wait until. Um, Go into the our room, shut the door, and then wait, and then drop out of the the bedroom window. Go where I'm going, and then when I come back, the kitchen window was open, so I just sneak through the kitchen window, shut it back, and take time and go into my bed. So this is when you were fourteen. Fourteen. Yeah. Yeah. What time did you used to sneak out? Eh? What time did you used to sneak out? We used to sneak out for go blues. <laughs> um, unless sometimes. Uh, I'd say I say I used to sneak out probably about one ish. One o'clock. Whenever I was fast asleep. When I know my mother was fast asleep. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And, what time and even sometimes when she wasn't even fast asleep, because she was in the room watching TV, uh -huh. and we just have to go out like say, we were, um, go on a bed, so go into our bedroom and shut the door. And bam, my younger brother would, wouldn't come with me because he was too young, so I, I was just shh, bam, blue. And jump out of the window and go, I go to blues. But that was the odd blues in Stone Square, weren't they? That was afterwards. That was after I went a little bit older. Hmm. Um, but the, well, the first blues I actually did go to was Rusty Blues at Parfartcliffe. Yeah. Rusty, Rusty, Howard, Howard. Yeah. Oh, Rusty Senior. Not Howard, the older little dad, boy. Yeah. Or, or, or younger Barry, than me. Barry, Barry, Barry. In, in father, Rusty yeah. Senior. They yeah. used to keep blues at Parfartcliffe. That was my first experience of going to Blue. Where, where was this? Far, far, far. Terrace. Terrace. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's, that was a popular, popular, uh, it was a popular, popular um, blues. blues. Yeah. People used to come from all over, even Leeds. That's off Tuller Lane, towards the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then my, my next um, experience of Blues is that we used to jump on train. Yeah. Okay, the last train. Our yeah. last bus and go to Leeds. Go to Leeds, where you had Chapel Town, which was yeah, a and far then, and then black community. Sometimes we would go to the West Indian Centre, or the Mandela back yeah. then, or yeah. the community, we used to have a community centre yeah. in a Chapel Town. Mm. So, me and me and Scoot used to go them time there, yeah. we was young. Yeah. Um, Primrose Hill School, where mm. they used to have a regular um, yearly thing there. We mm. used to go, I can remember going there and then staying. Mm. After they walked down to the blues, mm. and from the after the blues finished, we would walk to the train station, uh, wait for the first train or the first bus. So you have to wait till the following morning, five, following five, morning six o'clock or whatever time it came. To then come up to Redford. Wow, wow, wow. That's how that's all we used to um, rip back. So you had obviously in Bradford, you had Barry's Blues. Was there any other famous blues in in Bradford that people used to forget, or was that the main blues? I'd say that was the main place. I also remember going to Canterbury. Uh huh. The used to keep. Mm. I tell you, we used to keep blues up there. Mark Butters. Yeah, I didn't know him, but I think. Yeah. Now and again, there were blues in Canterbury. Yeah, Canterbury. and um, when name and Westbourne. Robert Williams we used to keep, uh, you know, cooler. They used yeah. to have blues up there, yeah. Yeah. Um, which was Canterbury, Canterbury yeah. blues. And then after that was New, um, Newby. Yeah, Newby, Newby Square. Square. Newby yeah. Square, yeah. Newby Square mm -hmm. blues. And then, like uh, Victor said earlier, yeah. Slough Square. Yeah. We used to have the had blues um, down there. And Slough Square was a place you wouldn't get much complete play because... These are flats, you know. These, these are flats. flats. <laughs> and and it, it was kind of a rough place, so people, they're, they're not the kind of people to call police. police. Pad, to yeah. pad, anyway. So Barry's Blues was in a house, was it a cellar? Yep, in, a, in, 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 in his cellar. In and his, his cellar. cellar was done out for blues. It was, it was padded, it had boarding, it was done up, it had... The bullets way it was a nice clean old place. That's where the sound system. That's where the sound um, system. Was. It was going. It's, it's actually. It's actually. It was true going to the blues and then, um, linking up with slackness. It was Clive and what's it? Clive like? Slackness Brown. Rest yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, Big yes, so, yeah. That um made me then get interested in the sound thing. In the sound thing. Yeah. 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 So blues. You know what? I always I've had this conversation many times, even with my kids. Because I've got I've, I've got twelve kids, uh -huh. um, sixteen grand picnic. So sometimes I sit down and I talk to them about back in the days, and they ask me and some of them will say, "Dad, Dad, Granddad, if you had a chance now to go back this decade, will you go to?" And I always say the seventies. Seventies. Yeah, because I remember. Because I have to choose a decade, so it's like the back ends of the seventies going into the eighties, into the eighties, was one of the best times in my growing up. Wicked. So you obviously went to plenty blues. Now the other blues you mentioned in Sloan Square, Newby Square, were they in houses or were they flats? They were more all flats. They flats. were flats. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But most most blues, even in Canterbury, was flats. Flats. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Barry's was really the only house. Yeah, yeah. Cellar. cellar. In a yeah. cellar. So, still going back to this definition of blues. So, a lot of the times in the 70s and 80s, black people found it difficult to 
to rave in town, in the centre of town. There was a lot of racism, you get into fights or whatever. And plus you couldn't hear your music, reggae music and other forms of black music back in those days. So you had these unofficial nightclubs, if you like, in people's cellars or in flats where you would have the place cleared out. You'd have a sound system or a DJ playing music till the early hours. You could buy food and you could buy drinks as well. Well, I tell you, how, I tell you how bad it was for us, how good it was back then in Sloan mm -hmm. Square. Some of the flats then were used to keep blues is when people used to move out. Okay, so they were derelict. Yeah. So there was, there was people would move out and we, people would just plan, plan for keep blues in there. Yeah, and run it over the weekend and then you know. Yeah. And um, there was another popular blues down in Sloan Square, mm. which was number 18 Sloan Square West. Yeah. Um, which, um, yeah, Rupi Dan, he used to have, he moved, he used to have a, a flat there and that's where they used to keep the Rasta meeting. That's where I, fre I used to frequently go there and sit down and have, have meetings. Um, Reverend Bunny, mm. Rupi Dan, all Rast Rastafarians. Yeah, Barrows. Yeah. And all of them they used to um they used to keep the um so I I used to live in Sloan Square so I used to go to the meetings them and sit down and yeah. um that's where my um learning mm. and trod on the, the Rasta Liberty started mm. um yeah. through there. And then afterwards that was turned into a regular blues. Yeah. And I'm saying and I was given the key to um to control it, because Rupi um, moved from there up to Botasha. Uh -huh. So, but he keep he did keep the flat, yeah. that flat. Mm. So a, a lot of blues was keep in. And Victor, your experience of blues, which blues did you used to frequent? I came across to Leeds most. You went most, to Leeds yeah. most of the time. Yeah. In Chapel Town. Yeah. Spencer. And you know where I mean you, you, there were some a few famous blues in Chapel Town. Yeah. yeah. You used oh, to drive I, you used to drive down. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you're uh, more mobile in that respect. So you, you you would just This is yeah, late seventies and even yeah, even early eighties. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it was about that time there was a lot of a big scare about Chapel Town because you had the Yorkshire Ripper, didn't you, Peter Sutcliffe? And he used to frequent <laughs> One and two places in, in Chapel Town. Um, so you had that we, vibe. We couldn't go. It, it, you'd be amazed how much um, policing of the black people then. Mm. They didn't know who they're looking for. Yeah. And so they would set up a roadblock. And you might have no tax mm. or no insurance. Mm. So as soon as you see the roadblock, you turn off, don't you? Mm. But they expect that, so wherever you turn off, <laughs> they'd be policing their waiting. And that was in Chapel Town, they used In to Bradford. In Bradford, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. You, so yeah, I didn't notice that much in 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 Leeds. By the time you get to Leeds, it's, mm. yeah, but anywhere you move, because mm. it wasn't just Leeds they were looking, they were, they were all everywhere. But you know, the blues, them, going back to the blues, them in Leeds. Um, I think that was in the early 80s. Yeah. It was 99 and Cliff's Blues we, we used to go. Which 99 Blues was one of the most popular ones. Yeah. So like I said, we would go to um, Percy. Yeah. From Percy to Mayflower. Hmm. From Mayflower to Sunlight and Cafe. And then Shot go over. Oh yeah. Over Leeds. Parker's. Yeah, mm -hmm. Parker's Cafe. And then yeah. Shot go over Leeds. And more, majority of the time it was 99. Hmm. Um, I didn't really go to Cliff. No one again I used to go to Cliff Blues, but it was mostly 99. And 99 was in Bradford, yeah? No. In Leeds. In Leeds. Yeah. But I, 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 I didn't go as much then, you know what I mean? Hmm. Because you had your children. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you were looking after them in the, in the evenings. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, around 86 time, you re relocated to Birmingham. Yeah. Um, Bingy, you were still around in Bradford. So, Cl club started closing slowly, yes, is that correct? Not in the 80s. Not in the 80s, it was no. mainly in the 90s. I would say, because up into the 80s, mm. we, we had pl not places to go in the 80s. Yeah. Um, like I said, we had 
Mayflower, mm. Palm Cove. Yeah. And um They were all running in the eighties. Yeah, there was a like, Yeah, the eighties were still Yeah, 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 yeah. Up until up until the up until the nineties. Mm. Yeah. There was always somewhere to go in the, in Bedford. So the changes in terms of the closure of black meeting places started in the nineties. Well, if I I cannot remember exactly, but Mayflower, I think they said closed in the nineties. Mm. Um, Perseverance. Late nineties. Mm. No, Mayflower, sorry. Mm. It closed in the um, late nineties or mid nineties, from yeah. what I can remember. Yeah. Um, the Percy closed and was then opened as the Drummond. The Drummond. But if I'm not wrong, I'm sure that they said it used to be called the Drummond's before First. it was Percy. Yeah, yeah. And then um I can't remember exactly when the drum man closed. Hmm. Um but Mayflower was open. But you know what? But then it didn't really bother me in particular because I was into the music scene anyway. We used to travel, we used to go to Sheffield, nothing I'm London, we used yeah, to go about so not, we used to go to Leeds. Hmm. So we didn't really it didn't really affect us. That's even much. if there was nowhere to go, Cause even when Mayflower was at our palm Cove was, and we would still jump at in our car and drive somewhere in that yeah, in that in that Various shore, clubs so. like Donkey Man's in Sheffield. And yes, and and them and them time there. Yeah, yeah. We we didn't sit down. Like I said, I was a, a we was a venturous um, yeah. group of people who I used to move around with. So yeah. we used to go all over the place. Mm, so mm. we used to find somewhere to go. Yeah. So. Basically, the front line is still there in the 80s, um, and <clears throat> there's no, uh, what can I say, hostility at that time with the front line. I mean, <coughs> you know, you're still there, um, it's a multicultural place, you have people from other races as well. Well, I'll tell you this, if I can give you my point on it, up until the 90s, Mm. I, I don't, I can't say that there was any issue, any problems with any other community when it came to the front line from mm. what I, from where I used to stand, mm. there was no issues, there were no problems. Um, mm. Nope, everything was alright into the, up, up into the 90s. Mm. Yeah. But the changes died in the 90s, is that correct? Well, like I said, Mayflower was open in the 90s. Mm. Palm Cove was open in the 90s. Um, I know that down the road on, in, on Lum Lane, mm. a, a place called the Ivory, not Ivory, um, at the bottom of um, where Barroots, yeah. where you call it, where you call them, they used to have a club down there. Mm. That was in the in the nineties as well. Mm, mm. Um, yeah, so there were still places to go for us. Still places to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. In in the even in the early nineties, mm, mm. there was there was places to go. But as the nineties progressed, things gradually started changing, and certain places closed down for the well, lo for the people who relied on the local scene. Well, in the in regarding to Mayflower, that. I can't, I can't put a time when mm. that actually closed down, but yeah. that, that closed down. Mm. Um, Palm Cove was open because in nine, in, no, even into, if, yeah, even into the late nineties, into the late nineties, the reason why I'm saying that we had PCR in mm. the, in the PCR eighties, radio, yeah. Yeah. Into the late, um, eighties, in the nineties, all those places were still open, so nothing didn't really start closing down until in 2000, because 2002, mm. um, I think Mayflower was closed by then, but, Mayf um, but Palm Cove was still going on. Right, right. Because when we, we took over the Young Lion in, in 2000, mm. and after we closed the Young Lion, when it, we, at night when we used to close the Young like, like, Lion, we used to leave there and go to Palm Cove okay, sometimes. Okay. So, so everything was open, Palm Cove was still going on. Mm -hmm. I think by, by then Mayflower was closed. Mm. Um, there was 
I think Ivory Bar. No, it wouldn't mean Ivory Bar because it was at the bottom. Mm. Paul Joseph. Him and his brother them used to run a place. I figure I can't remember the, the name of it, but that was at the bottom of Lum Lane. Mm. That was like a blues, because that's kind of open like late, late, mm. run to early morning. Yeah. yeah. So in, in the 2000s, that was open. Mm. So there was a place for black people to go. To go even up until yeah. the early 2000s. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Victor, you came back to Bradford then, was it? Um, oh, I came back um, 98, 99. Oh, 98, 99. And still at that but time, I, like Bingy said, there were still yeah. places that were open. Yeah, but yeah. I, I, I was working nights then. I you were working nights. NHS. Yeah. Mainly nights. Yeah. Yeah. So. Very rarely I could go out. Okay. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And I'm the opposite. But then time, I'm star river. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I mean, I lie, sometimes even seven days a week we used to rave. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. So everything obviously is still there's still stuff for, uh, uh, and places for the black community in Bradford to go. Um, the front line is still open, it's just the perseverance that's closed down. Uh, you still got the Young Lions Cafe open, you still got the bedding shop open, and you still got black clubs, you know. Um, so that's that. Um, <clears throat> now, obviously one of the landmark um, uh, moments in race relations history in Bradford um, was the murder of Dexter Coleman and the attack on the Young Lions Cafe in, on the 14th of July 2000. Um, but that, obviously, whatever happened didn't happen spontaneously. Um, Bingy, do you, did you notice, you know, even in the years running up to 2000, um, was there any kind of like tensions on the front line as it were? Well, first and foremost, like what you brought up, the Dexter mm. Coleman, which... Rest in peace. I used to call him X. Yeah. We all know him as X. Um, his murder. Mm. It should be pointed out, it didn't have nothing. I've heard, I've heard this narrative being spread that it was to do with drugs. Yeah. It had nothing to do with nothing drugs. to do with drugs. Nothing whatsoever. So let's put that to one side. Yeah, we will discuss that obviously yeah. in full yeah. in, in just a second. But yeah. leading up to that, um, so le leading up to um to um Dexter Coleman's um murder, hmm. are you asking what led to that? Yeah, I mean, were they? I've read in the Telegraph and Argus that even a year before the Dexter Coleman murder, there was tensions on the front line, the cafe was firebombed at one time, there were standoffs sometimes on, on Lum Lane. Okay, well, I, I, I know definitely about them. Yeah, this issues. was a couple of years before Dexter Coleman. Yeah, I know definitely about them issues. So basically... Late 1990s. Yeah, so let me just explain something. When we was growing up, majority of what they call the ethnic community was like in in that era was Afro Caribbean. In London. There was there was also a lot of Asian, whether it be Pakistan, Indian or Bangladeshi. Yeah. In that community. But it seemed to be a mixture of black, white and Asian community in that community. Mm. But black people were prevalent in that era. Mm. Um, that's where all the entertainment life was. Mm. That was where our nightlife was. Like I said, we had, you had the blue, blue Moon Cafe down the road also. Where mm. you, and then you had the, which was on Lum Lane, you had the Young Lion Cafe, mm. which was also on Lum Lane. You had the Perseverance, which was on Lum Lane, down the road of Manigam. Mm. You had Mayflower. You had the Sunlight Cafe, which was just a walking distance from there. And then you had a five, ten minutes drive to to um Allen's Road, which had the Palm Cove. Mm. So um it, it was alright. Then obviously like everything you got a change in dynamics in regarding to the community. 
And then obviously you got a lot of the Pakistani community that started to get more prevalent. Yes. And you had a lot of the Afro-Caribbean community that was moving out. What For what reason? But it was personal or uh, because they had to move because of housing issues or there was, there was closing down these properties or uh, working on these properties and mm. whatsoever. So the Pakistani community now became more prevalent, prevalent and, and their numbers began to grow. grow. Mm. In any situation, you're going to get, and then it's like, I have to be honest, back then, the Afro-Caribbean community was powerful mm. from my point of view in regard to sticking together. Mm. We had a unity and a strength and we had numbers back then. Mm which was also a unification with also the Asian population because when we used to have national front uh, marches far right back then, groups, yeah. you used to have which I can remember one um, one Anwar Qadir who was an Asian guy mm. he was one of the main persons who used to organize these marches mm. and when you had the marches and we went on a couple, there was a mixture of white, black and Asian. Hmm. So the dynamics changed even because, as you know, the Pakistani community is like a Muslim community. Yeah, Muslim community. So they come from a religious point of view. So they would probably think that they've moved into the Man Manigam era hmm. and they've got prostitution. Yeah, because Lum Lang was a red light area. Exactly. So they moved into that. So obviously you're going to have their leaders or community leaders are saying, well, listen, this is not suitable for us. Hmm. Now, some people will argue and say, well, listen, you've moved into the era and, and this was here before you was here. So the pubs, the clubs. And yeah. Everything. So that they got moved down onto Fountain Road. Yeah. And then obviously you had the Young Lion Cafe. Yeah. Which I've heard the argument that they they were saying that it was problematic because people was coming to the Young Line Cafe to purchase drugs. There was loud noise, there was incidents, there was arguments and then obviously I heard one at a time that they was trying to get a petition to close down the Young Lions Cafe. Right. And um which that caused a little fiction within our community and say, well, listen, they're not going to lock down this. Especially when we know that the, the perseverance had gone, that was turned into a chemist. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So we're saying, well, plus I know that Palm Cove Robbie Rooster have problems with the Palm Cove also. The Palm Cove Club, yeah, which is the Black Home Club. Which is right in the middle of a... Of a it's an estate. Uh, it's, it's private places. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's um, on this road, it's surrounded by houses, houses yeah. yeah, which is majority is a Pakistani community yeah. around. Yeah. So I know that it used to have problems because I used to deal with Robbie to put on shows and to do things. Mm. And I know that it used to have issues with complaints about car parking when something was on and mm. And obviously it's a it's a club so there be liquor, there might be noise, there might be whatever the case may be. So I know he was getting issues. Mm. So from that point of view, the, from that point of view, that's where any friction, I think that's where the friction came up mm. within Man. the Afro-Caribbean community and the Pakistani community mm -hmm. within that section. I'm not going to say the whole of Bradford had an issue yeah. with the Afro-Caribbean community and the black community, I yeah. mean the Asian community. It was round there where there was issues with the young lion, which they were saying was problematic, which yeah. it wasn't. Because hmm. our culture is different. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, they might say that there was drug going on. No, there wasn't drug going on in the cafe. There might be drug, drugs um, going on outside the cafe. But mm. there was none going on within the cafe. Yeah. It's like the pub, it's like the bookies. 
there was no drug selling going on within the bookies, but there might be drug selling going out. Yeah. They could also say that about the pharmacy, pharm uh, pharmacies which when Percy closed down, people might have been selling drugs outside the pharmacies, but they wasn't selling drugs inside the pharmacies. It was unlumbly in itself. Mm -hmm. So if the argument to close down the young lion or the bookers, it should also have been the argument to close down the, the pharmacies mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So from from that's where I think that the that the dynamics change in regarding to any tension within the, the community yeah. when it came to the Afro Caribbean and the Asian community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Leading up until the Dexter, did that have anything to do with what the tension? No, because this incident regarding the Dexter didn't happen with nothing to do with the tension. The tensions were there in the years running up to it in terms of wanting the, the local Pakistani community wanting the cafe to close down um, and the Robbie's Club as well, the Palm Cove, having an area which was different to how it is. Yeah, because the dynamics have changed, mm. because the, the, the majority of the people in all those areas was Pakistani, was Pas Pakistani Muslim yeah. community. Yeah. So obviously the cultural change that manifested over the years had, had completely changed. Mm. Where it was a vibrant Afro-Caribbean cultural community, surrounding community. Mm. it was now going to be a predominantly Pakistani Muslim community. Yeah. So obviously because of that no, they're saying certain things which is going against their culture and their religion, mm. i.e. the red light era, the the young lion thinking that drugs are being sold from there, mm. the palm cove music being played, liquor being sold, mm. so that's where the tension came in regarding to the tension between yeah. them. But it was mostly in that era. In that era. And also we have to remember as well then you had attitudes in it because obviously you've got the Africa members of the African Caribbean community are saying, well listen the Pakistani community is is growing, is getting stronger, but at the same time, they're not going to bully me or stop me do, from doing eating, what you want to do. What eating my food, as as the saying goes, in our community, or stop me from doing what I want to do. Mm. So that's where the tension came mm. from. Plus, you had a lot of yard men who moved to Bradford. Jamaicans. Jamaicans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And when they were on the front line, they. They don't uh, compromise either in terms of they're not going to well, be pushed. Over, they're not going to be pushed away. Yeah, it's, it's like with, with anything, can it? If you're, um, I'm not going to say that Jamaica is the same because mm. that would be a lie. But you do get some Jamaicans who are streetwise and they're not going to take. They're not going to take no kind of intimidation from no one. It doesn't make a difference who you are. Even if it's their own kind, they're not going to take no intimidation. Intimidation. So yeah. whether it's from white people or it, it, they're not going to take no intimidation. Mm. So that's where the heads are going to clash. Mm. Because they're, they're going to stab firm and say, no, you're not going to try to bad me up. You're mm. not going to try to bully me. Even though you're superior in numbers. Is, is, this is our front line. That's irrelevant. This is our front line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were here first. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So just because the areas changed and a lot of Caribbean families moved out, those people who moved out, they still used to gravitate towards the front line. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So even though everyone's moved so out, so the one still place, even though everybody's moved out, the one place that people might sit down in their house, whether it be. In the north side of Bradford, the west side of Bradford, the east side of Bradford, they would say, "Well, listen, tonight I'm going to go to the young line yeah. and it's sit the only down. Place to go, wasn't yeah, it? yeah. It's I'm nice. going to go to the young line, sit down, play some, eat some food, play some pool, play a card part, play some domino, and reason and talk. Yeah. Whether it was bullshit they was talking about or positive yeah. talk they was talking. It about. was the only That's where the hub was, where they were going to meet. Yeah, and. Afro-Caribbean people have been in Manningham since at least the 50s, way before any other community was predominant. 
so no one can tell them where to go. Basically, that was it. Yeah, and the clubs were there from the 50s onwards, so no one can tell them where to go. Even if the dynamics have changed and Caribbean families moved out, they, that was still the place to go to. Yeah. So, obviously, you had those tensions that happened. I mean, I read in the Telegraph and Argos there was a couple of standoffs as well on Lum Lane, um, you know, where people would just, you know, um, argue amongst the, you know, argue different groups of people would argue. Nothing serious happened at that time, but there was the odd standoff. I can, I can probably name a couple of standoffs, which was nothing. It could have happened anywhere with anyone. Mm. You've got the busy Lum Lane. Yeah. Yeah? And then you might have only put cars passing. Mm. One particular time, I can I remember where somebody was crossing the road. Mm. So the person who who was coming up the road was a um a Asian um car with about three, four people inside there. Mm. So the guy's walking um fire was going and then the car had come but nearly knocked him down so he slapped he slapped the um Bonnet. The bonnet. And said, yo, with the bomb of clock, yeah, do where, where this so it, was a, it was a black man they almost ran over. Well, he walked into the road, but he said he thought that they were saying things. So they've come the same way and they've stopped. So he slapped on the thing. So obviously that led to an argument hmm. where people have come around and started cussing and, they, and, the, and, the, and the guys have been in the car, they're defending their argument and saying, get out the road anyway. Is mm. stepping on the on the thing, mm. so that was just a little small thing. Mm. And then that night later on, something happens which they said was related to what happened. Then nobody's sure, you know what I'm saying? Where somebody had drive past and made gun sign, you know what I'm saying? And mm. so 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 basically, it was things like that which people them started to have little. Basically, making a mountain out of a memorial, mm. nothing out of something, mm. nothing serious. Just I wouldn't say that it was because it was a Asian man or a Pakistani man in a car and it's a black man. Mm. I would just say that it was a incident where happened, mm. which happened to be a black guy and in the car it happened to be a, a Pakistani guy mm. or whatever. Mm. And then that night, the draw past making gun sign. Yeah. Which most men don't like that because basically what you're, what you're trying to say is you yeah, drove past the front line, yeah, and pointing at people hanging around outside the yeah, front just, line you know, with, a, like, with a gunshot. So they, so people were saying that the boy them who 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 um, nearly, um lit down this particular person early and and rear and that's what they talk about. So mm -hmm. it was just little small little stupid little yes. things. I wouldn't say that it was anything to really lose mm. any sleep but it was just little stupid things like that yeah, so sometimes yeah. it gets blown out of proportion that there's a, a there's a tension going on around there yeah so from that point of view yeah and i suppose to be quite honest i think a lot of uh, people would probably say it because we used to leave from where we was to come to the young lion mm. and probably the the surrounding community would be saying well listen you don't like you don't even live around here you come from where you are to come here to make noise and to 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 be loud and to to sell drugs and to you understand me? So mm -hmm. I suppose that's where they was going. Why they were saying that they want the young line to be closed to stop with the gathering of people. Yep. Right. And um, so yeah, um, that's what happened. Do you have any um, experiences of of this when you came back to Bradford? Was there the odd occasion, Victor, when you did go front, when you could get away and go to front line? I didn't see any of it. You didn't see. I any didn't of see it. any yeah. of that. But ah. the 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 feeling was there because the feeling of not being wanted. Yeah, of not belonging. Yeah. Because when you when you go up there, there's less hardly any black people mm. and houses are being built yeah you know mm. and it's and it's so it's not it wasn't like a it wasn't like the front line we knew it looks more like residential you yeah, know yeah. Um, by then they're like 
all the girls have been moved away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just quiet, mm, mm. you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can see that. I can see how they feel because they don't accept. They don't accept black people like like being the, the type of culture, the culture, the lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, and mm. yeah. So that we yeah. just live. But then there's no pretense. Mm. You know. So that's obviously some tensions there, and um, the cafe was also firebombed. So you probably heard about that as well, Bingy, uh, a year bef uh, a year before uh, Dexter Coleman. And uh, do you have any um, information as to, or do you know why it was firebombed at all? Well, I don't know 100% why, oh. but I can say what I um, believe happened. Hmm. It, that again come from a confrontation that happened either earlier in the day yeah. or in the week. Hmm. And no one can't be 100%. It's like if I have an argument with Victor, no. Yeah. yeah. And me and him are arguing. And he gets to the point where he gets broken up and Victor goes his way and I go my way. And then later that night, he has to, um, Victor's always get firebombed mm. or someone shoots after him. Mm. They're going to say, I've been doing it, you know, because him and yeah. Victor did have an argument. Mm. But I might be innocent. Mm. I don't know. I don't know nothing about it. It, it might be another issue that he's had with somebody before. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But that's where it's, that's where it's going to come from. Mm. No, when it was firebombed, I know that everybody was upset and vexed. And the same talk was going around that no one is going to close down this and not going to burn down this. And man started to talk certain talk and reach to the position where people was even going to talk about sitting down in the club with machine and this and that. And that's where it reached to. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So um, nobody really can say who did it or why it happened because nobody was there when it happened. Yeah. That's all I can say. Mm. A detailed examination of the crime scene was underway today, well hidden from the public view. Police were also speaking to those who'd seen last night's violence. Witnesses say a gang of Asian youths descended on the Young Lions Cafe, which is used mainly by the local African Caribbean community, and they ransacked it. Fighting broke out with up to 50 people involved. It culminated in the shooting dead of the 27-year-old man. He's been named as Dexter Horace Coleman from West Bowling. Another African Caribbean man was also injured. Local people say the area's had drug problems for years which haven't been tackled. Last night's violence has left them shocked and angry. My kid lives down the road. He's going home, he's pedalling on his bike to go home and he can't get past because they're all fighting and carrying on. He doesn't know what's going on, he's terrified. It's not people around here. I get on with, around here, we live with Caribbean people, we live with English people, name it, and we're all like family, like family, you know what I mean, end of the day. But a lot of trouble comes from outside, you know what I mean, yeah. Nearby, an hour earlier, a car driven by an Asian man was attacked by African Caribbean youths. Police are investigating links between the two incidents. We'd like any information on who the people who were involved in the earlier incident involved in the car were, and if anyone has information on that, please contact us. The area remains cordoned off as the search for those responsible for last night's murder continues. Inquiries were concentrated here today. As forensic examinations were carried out, officers were attempting to trace those who witnessed last night's shooting. Local people said things are getting out of hand. I think it's getting worse and worse by day by day. And how do you feel as a resident? Well, I'm getting older by day by day and I'm frightened by myself. I mean, it's whistling dark uh, nights. I mean, nobody wants to live in an area where, you know, sort of people are going around, you know, popping, you know, using guns. It's, you know, bad news, isn't it? When police arrived last night, they found the situation tense and one man with gunshot wounds. The 27-year-old from Jamaica was pronounced dead shortly after arriving at hospital. A second man was assaulted, though not shot, his condition stable. This cafe, pictured after a firebomb attack in September, was at the centre of the disturbance and was again badly damaged.
there was a serious disturbance uh, outside the cafe to start with which spilled inside where the man was shot. Uh, a large number of, of people certainly were damaging the, the cafe, uh, upwards of 20. There were customers inside. This bookies was robbed in the aftermath of the shooting. Those who live and work here say nothing's ever done. No, nothing since this incident. I mean, we had uh, just over a year ago, and uh, you know, we asked for you know the police and the council to get involved, and maybe you know find some kind of a solution to the problem we got around here. I mean, everybody knows what the problem is, and uh, you know, the community around here is being intimidated. You shouldn't be terrified going up your own street, and the people around here are terrified. It's wrong. The police should clamp down. Whatever's going on, sort it out once and for all. Just before this incident, a Vauxhall Amiga driven by an Asian man was damaged by a gang of Afro-Caribbean youths in Green Lane. Police say it may be connected and want witnesses to both. The Bishop of Bradford has appealed for calm after a weekend of violence in the city. It follows two separate incidents and comes just over a fortnight after one man, Dexter Coleman, was shot dead. Some residents living in the West Bowling area of the city have accused the police of not doing enough to crack down on crime. This report from our crime correspondent, John Cundy. A bullet hole in the wall of a house in Bradford. Cartridge marks on the road. The car in which two men were fired at. All signs of the latest in Bradford's round of shootings and kidnappings. Yeah, one lad was bad who got shot on the back, both sides, two shot. And the other lad got shot on the legs. And when I uh, seen them, and they were very, very badly worried, and I says, it's best to ring the police because it's uh, not a little thing, it's a very bad thing. Residents want quicker police action, even after the 16 arrests already made over the incidents. The way it's been handled at the moment, there's not a lot of police around here at the moment. I mean, it was only Saturday, so I'll, this should still be at least scouring the places, find out what's going on, but I don't see that. Are people worried locally? Yeah, they are, yeah. Very worried. There's a lot of people who won't go out. You know, all the little people around this corner won't go out at night. I think it's scandalous. Yeah. All the shootings that have been going on in Bradford just lately. There have been four shootings in the past fortnight in various parts of the city. The latest came this weekend in addition to a kidnapping. A shrine marks the spot where Jamaican Dexter Coleman was shot dead. The crimes have left the city's bishop pleading for calm. There's a very real anxiety. It may be portrayed as racial violence and interracial violence, and it isn't. It is gang warfare. It is to do with a criminal lifestyle. But people are really very tired of it, and I tried publicly to articulate what they've been saying to me. But campaigners for Dexter Coleman's family are sensitive to some tensions between their minority community and Bradford's Asians. The Asian community and the Bradford community as a whole have got to find ways in which we're going to live together and, and, and benefit from a quality of life that we aspire to. We are all here to, to, to work together, we live together in peace and harmony, and I think uh, this is the message that I want to get across to the local communities. Whatever the tensions, police say they're determined to hunt down Bradford's young criminal gangs. One of the men shot at uh, on Saturday was only 16 years old. So it, it's sinister, it's of great concern to us, but we're taking positive action, we're doing something about it. With the public's help, we'll get these people put away. But Dexter Coleman's shrine is a reminder of how dangerous those gangs are proving. John Cundy, BBC Look North, Bradford. People of all races took to the streets to call for peace and pay tribute to Dexter Coleman, shot dead in Lum Lane two weeks ago. We want Bradford to be a peace, peaceful community for white, black and Asian. So that's why one of the reasons we get the match. I think the actions of a few people uh, have, have shown that the, the people firing off, uh, off firearms in the street is totally unacceptable to the population. Since the killing, there's been a string of unrelated gun attacks across the city, including two drive-by shootings and an abduction. It's bad. It's bad for the area. It's bad for the community. It's bad for everybody. 
just frightening. It's really, you know, the police about all the time. You're on edge all the time, you know, wondering it's going to kick off. The peace campaigners say they're satisfied with the police response to the unrest in the city, which has resulted in nine men appearing in court on charges of violent disorder, wounding and kidnap. But they're still appealing for help to catch Dexter Coleman's killer. The plaque is just a memory of him. Just to show that people don't forget and respect, respected him, and just let people know that we're sorry for what happened. It was a tragic incident, and we hope that nothing don't happen again. So we just wanted to make a um, a point that we're just going to put a plaque up and remember Dexter as he was. So that's <clears throat> leading up to obviously um, what happened. So obviously now. Fast forward to the 14th of July 2000 and the attack on the Young Lions Cafe and, and the murder of Dexter Coleman, who was one of your friends. Um, obviously, that what happened followed on from events that happened elsewhere in Bradford. So do you want to touch on what you believe were the causes of the attack? On well, this is, not, this is not even a belie belief. This is what me know. Uh -huh. Happen. Because yeah. you have obviously a lot of you know yeah because I, I know the people who was there when it happened uh -huh. so basically there was a pub on Man uh, Man uh, Manchester Road yeah where certain people was two girls get into an argument yeah. and start to fight right the people who was with one set of the girls instead of parting the fight they joined them which is man a giant in to beat these other girls who was fighting. So their boyfriends were like slapping up. Whether I don't know if his boyfriends or his brother or yeah. some kind of or yeah. whatever. Yeah. But they have joined instead of breaking up the two or three women them who was fighting, they yeah. have joined in. So ex and female people was in the pub. They don't even ex didn't didn't even know the girls them. Mm. All they were saying is, yo. You're wrong. You can't be beating the, the girl. Mm. You can't stop. So they stop it. The other set of man them, which these are black men, mm. was started to get in an argument with ex and female people them. Mm. And it reached to a point where one of the man them was putting his hand in his trousers. As if he had a gun. As, yeah. So um, ex and fame people then pick up buckle and started to buckle them out of the place. So long story run, they had to end up a, a run. Okay. Um So they after, got shown up basically and yeah. And I'm saying so after that after that these particular people who had this confrontation with X and his people, which is a black youth hmm. from Leeds, hmm. has then called upon a Asian brother who he knows. Yeah. So this Asian man thinking he is a bad man and a gangster yeah. has come up to the front line with this um, particular um, youth from yeah. Leeds and draw past pointing at the people them who was, you know, like at the front of the, there was a wall that they used to sit down. I forgot which what yeah. shop was there. Yeah. But there was a sit down on the wall. So there's a few guys, Afro Caribbean guys, on the front line on the sitting, hanging sitting down on the wall. Yeah. You used to have the slope where you walk up to go around to go to the um, bookie. Yeah. So there was sitting on that wall there. Yeah. Looking towards where the bus stop is, so you can. So this car has has pulled up. Yeah. Yeah, and stopped, and and he's pointing up and pointing at certain people. So. The people are more sitting on the wall is looking now and saying, Yo, this I same boy from the other day, mm. I look up. So they've 
So, so they run off the wall and walk towards the car and, and, say, and like to say, so, yo, who are you pointing at? Yeah. What's your problem? Where you come from now? Yeah. So the car's done a, a U-turn yeah. and gone back down and done another turn and parked at the corner of Long Lane, which is away, and they've come out their car again doing the same thing, standing like they've got Bring their hands in their pockets. Yeah. So the man them now I pick up stone and buckle it and just rush, run off towards them and started to fling stone. It reached to a point where they couldn't even get the car and drive in them had to run away and leave the car onto the and onto the onto the way I call it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So um and that's and that's what's happened. And then while the man them are sitting down there, about two, three hours afterwards, they run there and from nowhere cars man are run up and then obviously the result is that X was shot. So in, you had in the back. like l two or three hours after the stoning incident, you had like dozens, like loads of cars full of Pakistani youths. Um, and obviously, obviously, if you want to describe the events, what happened from what you, what you. Um, well, I, I wasn't there at the time when it happened because yeah. I was I'm, I was getting it all after it happened by the yeah. people who was there. Yeah. And what I've told you is exactly what I was told. Mm. I wasn't there. Mm. I arrived because I got a phone call that the the by a couple of people who was on the lane calling calling phones, people phoning, and then I got a phone call that said yo. Um, the man them attack um, the lane and bust gunshot. Mm. So I used to live down uh, White Abbey. I had a flat down there, so I we was down there. So we jumped up there. Um, now I'm lying. I wasn't there. I got a taxi. I think I was in ta town, so I jumped in a taxi and I told the taxi to drive go up to Lumley. And when I drove up there, paid the taxi and I come out, there was all the people now leaving. So I come up and I said, "What the fuck's going on here?" And some Asian guys on the street and I said, oh, it's, some of your people have, have messed with the wrong with the wrong people and and that." So I'm there walking. So I've walked round now. I didn't. I just looked up towards where the the, the book is was. Yeah. There was people running from that side, running, jumping in that car, and I've walked round. Nobody didn't say nothing to me. Nobody didn't put their hand on me. Yeah. And I just walked round to the cafe. This time they were barricaded up in the in the cafe. Yeah. So I couldn't get through the front door. So I've walked round the back and look up, and this is where I seen the man them looking out the window, and they were saying X had been shot, but they had X like up against the window at the back. Okay. So I was saying, is, is that X? I said, take him down there. They was trying, I think they were trying to take him out of the window. You know, yeah. Or get him out. Mm -hmm. So by the time everybody has left the area, the door's open. It's now open. The brought X out. is on the um, pavement outside. Some There was a, a doctor's place down the road. Mm -hmm. And I think some people from down there has come. And basically they was trying. But I can tell when something serious and just by looking at X and I, I knew that it was serious because it was lifeless yeah um you could see the blood um it was shot, it was actually shot in the back right you know what i'm saying mm. and um just by looking at him you could tell say he wasn't going to survive, mm. survive. and just uh, backtracking for those viewers who never saw the first uh, interview with morris and patrick Basically, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bingi, uh, a group of about around 100 Pakistani youths after they pulled up outside. I, 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 heard, I, heard figure, I heard figures of 50, 100, 100 plus. Yeah. I wasn't there from the beginning. But well, when what I came did you there, hear about the events? They, they rushed the cafe. Is that yeah, yeah they, but they didn't directly rush the cafe to start with. Where the man then was standing up, which was up by it, where I told her that they were standing and wrong where the bucket era. Yeah. So. That's because if you if you think about it, they didn't come from the cafe side. They came from the other they came from the other side because the man them who was flinging the stone and buckle after them because they only thought that it was a couple of cars until they realized exactly how much people. So they then started to run.
towards the cafe. And some man would run up the side of the um where the perseverance is. Yeah. Some man run up this the the next side. Yeah. Um who there was a one particular person who actually got chopped, I think it was Metro, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. And some man then run in. So it it was raw they're not actually sure where exit get shot. Mm. But it was either when it was running just where the pub was yeah um the pharmacy to run towards the door the cafe that air a gunshot because when i was i went to the courts and i heard the events leading up but it wasn't sure exactly where about the gunshot mm -hmm. but some people said they hear the gunshot fired when just before they got into the thing when they was running towards the, the, cafe. the, the cafe when they went into the cafe mm -hmm. but it could have been when it, he was in the cafe because if he if would have reached into the cafe, he probably wouldn't get shot in his back. Mm. You understand me? So, so um, mm. he got shot running from the bookie yeah. era towards mm. the young lion, young lion in yeah. his back. But I can understand this. If, there's, if something happened in the pub earlier on, on my on leaves were on. Manchester Manchester Road. Road. Yeah. I can't remember okay. if it, I can't remember if it was early on mm. or if it was the day before mm. because it's that long ago I can't remember. I can't see the link between that and the and the storming of the cafe. I can't work out that link. Mm. And if two or three people had a problem in the pub up there, how mm. come there's a hundred people storming the cafe? Well I'm gonna tell you. Mm. The person who had got who was into the argument in yeah. the cafe, in Pakistan, the pub. Pakistani, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. oh, okay. The black guy who was in the argument, he came yeah. from Leeds. Yeah? Alright. He was a, he was the one who had the argument with um ex them. Pakistani. Yeah? No, yeah. with ex them. Yeah? This is the black guy, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 He's the one who's who's f girl was arguing with another girl. And instead of him part, it's like you go out with your girl now. Your yeah. girl is fighting with somebody else. Instead of you parting your girl and the other girl, you joining with your girl to beat the other girl. It's a Pakistani who shoot him. Yeah, but listen, you're not listening. Yeah? Mm. The, the black guy, no, and the, nobody don't even know who shoot him. A, 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 a Pakistani guy got convicted, but the person who got convicted is not the person who actually did the shooting. Let me just say that. So, when it was a black guy or an Asian guy, mm. that's another argument. But the person who get convicted is not mm. actually the person who... He was there mm. with them because he was part of the argument. But what I'm saying to you is, this is what's happened. So, you are the one who would been run out by me. I'm ex. I've run you away now. Mm. You're standing up with your hand in your yeah, so, thing. So, so, so ex, ex and fame boy, them have rushed him. Him run, he's gone. He's called, you have then called, you have then gone to call Ash. Yeah? Mm. You, you and him have driven up. So you are the black man and the Asian man have driven up in an Asian man car. Mm. You get rushed out of that car. The Asian guy know he feel disrespected. So he's then called for backup. You is in a ply to say, that these men up on the front line have robbed my drugs because that's the argument. Right. That's, he's used this as a ploy to tell people to rally them up to back him and the black guy to come attack the cafe. So, that's why. So basically after the car got stoned, phone calls were made yeah. saying that I, falsely that I've been robbed. It had nothing to do with any so, robbery. So all the people who come to fight, they're fighting for? For this popular, because the person who called them is a popular Asian guy in Bradford. Yeah, and, he's, he's, and he told people that he's been robbed. And he told them that he's, he's a known drug seller, let yeah. me say it like that. Yeah. yeah. And he had told people that he'd been robbed, but he hadn't been robbed. 
but he might tell people that so he can get the back of for come. Get them to come and help. So that's how hundreds of... Uh, so that's how so much he is your man because he's called this man, this man has called this man, and this man has called this man. I'm not trying to be funny. Let I me can't put understand it like why they were so ready to go and smash up a cafe though. Yeah. Yeah. For, you because, know. because... They when, turned it into a race. I'm thing. not trying to be said... Yeah. I won't even say it turned it into a race thing because it just happened to be the fact that he can call... He can call man if you come back at him mm. let me i'm just gonna put it like this yeah you remember what the shooting what happened couple of um about a year after the ex killing upper great upper yeah, little yeah, happened yeah, the taxi. Yeah, yeah. all right then it's a similar kind of incident i'm gonna explain what happened teddy dog is driving in his car yeah He's on a road, yeah. He have the right over here. This taxi driver from Little Lawton does not want to reverse. He wants dog to reverse all the way back on the road. Yeah. Yeah. Dog is refusing because he said he's got the right over here. The taxi man wouldn't move. The taxi man has already gone on his phone or on his radio. And call holy but more taxi man for come. So while Teddy and, and them is arguing with this taxi man now, out of the blue about 20 car. Yeah? Come on, let's be true. They can call, they can call, yeah, they can I go know. on the phone and call. I know. Them. I them. Yeah. About 20 car load of man have come for us them. Teddy and Steve had to run and leave their car. To get away from these man. While Teddy's what running kind, away. What kind of, that's, that, what kind of yeah. behavior is that? But like, listen, while Teddy's running away, he's turned around and say you fuck with the wrong person. Mm. So I said, so done. The next day, that happened on the Friday, I think it happened on the Saturday, the man walking cool and calm into little Orton taxi cab. Taxi cab take out a machine, point at the person who, 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 who the taxi man who diss him and say me tell you, back, back. Turn it on the head of the taxi man to kill him, who was inside there, mm. and, and the gun stick, he said, you're lucky, put him gun back inside and cool the walk away. Mm. That is not me who, who I didn't see, yeah. this is what them said on the news, yeah. the people who was inside there. So to say you don't understand, yeah. not trying to be funny, Many, many, many a times when you get into confrontations in Bradford with certain Asian men within minutes. You get a red, you get a whole mob together. Yeah. To come to come and back them. And because you Before are, you find out what is the problem, you're just coming mob handed for, mm. for, for back the situation. Yeah, without So that reason. is exactly what happened there. Yeah. So the argument is there was a narrative going around saying it had something to do with drugs, it didn't have nothing to do with the the um, the original incident happened in this pub mm. and it was a black guy that started the initial, the initial argument. There was no Asian and man. Asians argument. got involved, dragged into it. <laughs> and that's and they and then come into it. Mm. So my argument is it wasn't even racially motivated Dexter mm. um killing. It just happened to be that the fact of the matter is it was an Asian man, but the person who started it, instigated it, was a black youth. Mm. Because that's where the initial argument mm. went to. Mm. It didn't have to reach so far, as a matter of fact. Mm. If, he were, if he did have any problem, the same black youth from Leeds should have come to X and D with it. Yeah. You didn't have to go and call... I don't want to call the person's name. Asian people. Yeah. yeah. And, and where you call it and say, listen, some man this me re re this re re that boom bam 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 bam. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened. You had upwards of nearly a hundred Pakistani youths attack the cafe, chase a smaller group of Afro Caribbean men into the cafe. The cafe, they, they, they laid siege to the cafe. The Afro Caribbean people in the Young Lions Cafe had to go upstairs. Mm -hmm and throw a massive fridge and wedge it on the stairs and to what? avoid the Asian youth who are attacking the cafe how going far, upstairs. How far would they go if they could get up the steps? What do you think, Bingy? Well, that fridge, you know, say that fridge that they used to block the stairs save a lot of lives that day? Well, at the end of the day, when you're in war, 
that's what you have to do in it. Mm. You have to make sure that you. you yeah, but you, what, you would, what would they? What, what would they be doing it for? What would what would they say cause them to be so violent? What? Mm. It's nothing to do well, with them because you're saying it's it's two people's argument. Mm. From my point of view, I want to know why so many got it's involved like, yeah. and started attacking the cafe and started. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I put it? Can, yeah. I, can I can I answer that? All right then. I'm going to put my head on the block here. Yeah. yeah. I know if a man freak with me back in ideas and even know I can go up on the phone and I can get at least 50, 60 man to come back with me. Just like that. Mm. I know I can do that. Mm. Because I have yeah. the capability. And I know man will respect me. Whether I'm wrong or right, man mm. I will come back with me. Mm. So that is the that is a simple scenario. Well, you, have Some be, you have to be really threatened to be, to call them to come and do things here, mm. wouldn't you? So this man did really. No, but can, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just say, so can I say something? I think he might be. I, tell, I think he might be looking at it from a from a, a diplomatic point of view, where people nowadays they are not diplomatic, mm. and I think you are looking at it from a common sense point of view, where common sense is not that popular. Mm. And it's not that common. Mm -hmm. People nowadays, you see, it's this word, what you call R E S, what's the rest of it? E C T, respect. <laughs> respect. Right? No people, yeah, they want respect, but they don't give it. So mm -hmm. when, they are, when they feel like say, they are being disrespected, they want to prove, because remember, you know, in the street, when you think say you is this and that, you don't want the things say a man disrespect you. Mm. And that's what it's all about. That's, that's where it will start. And one man lose him life over nothing. That's exactly. like you said. Yeah. That's the argument. I know where you're coming from. But I, I could have been in that crowd fighting for somebody oh, without, without knowing. Mm. You know, it, it, that's because you're a logical person who thinks mm. logically. Yeah. And you've got common sense, so yeah. you're not going to involve yourself in a bullshit. Mm. And this. So, Bingy. In the so what happened in the aftermath of the attack? You went there, obviously, um, obviously towards the end. You saw what happened. Obviously, Dexter Coleman sadly passed away. You had the court case. You had the convictions. Anything else you want to add in the immediate after, well, in the days after the cafe was rushed, that you noticed or you can share? Well, after after this happened. Um, the, the big conversation within the community, mm. why I and my brethren did get involved is because people were saying, listen, we can't make the young lion get shot. Yeah. So I went to the meetings then. Mm. I was called upon to sit down um, in North community because they was thinking about backlash. They were thinking about whether or not there was going to be revised, uh, uh, reprisals and revenge, fire, and, revenge yeah. and whatsoever. Yeah. So I went to meetings where there was police there or whatever. No, the biggest thing that there was, the police were saying in these meetings, they were saying, listen, please let the police do their job. We don't want no revenge attacks. We don't want no reprisals because we know that X was a popular person. Mm -hmm. Under the grapevine, the police have got some information that the people who are going to be coming from London, Birmingham, wherever, mm -hmm. to revenge X is killing. Not only that, as a Jamaican. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Yeah. So, um, the talk was, the main topic now is to make sure so the young lion is... It's not closed. It's not closed. Nobody was interested because there was us. Morris was basically saying, "Listen, I'm too scared to go back." Yeah. Mm. Other people were saying, so I said, "Listen, I'll I will take it over." So you took over the young lines. I said, "I will take it over." Me and my bridge we did take it over. Mm. We said to the the police that said, "We said to the police, listen." This is our last community hub, like if you want to say. Meeting place. This is not. We want this to stay remain there. We are. We get. We are going to make sure. We are going to take over the place. We spoke. To, we spoke to the, the owners, hmm. and we were saying, "Listen, we will take over the place." There was an agreement, bam, 
contract was signed and me and my brethren went over. We fixed it up, we um, furnished the place, mm. changed the dynamics, bam, the police had meetings with we because we were the next people taking it over and they were saying, listen, mm. they want to know, um, they want us to liaison with the local community, Bob, Bobby, if you yeah. want to speak, yeah. who would like to come down there be able to come in, is it alright to for them? You say yes, so police them started to come there and even buy food from there. Oh, wicked. So Dexter Coleman obviously died and was murdered in the year 2000. So, what year did the cafe open? Was it the same year? Yeah, the same year. Within, 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 within months, we fixed it up and, and yeah, got it So, it was early. back up and running. So, it was back up and running. You even had a plaque. Commemorative plaque. Yeah, the police, the police, them was the meetings that we went to, they were saying, listen, what police, as a matter of fact, police actually did start to pass the, the, the police, they would park up the car, they would come in, they would order food, they would sell up in there talking, and they would, or a drink or whatever, buy a patty or whatever, mm. bam, and go. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's what we said. So that, that, uh, so the cafe is back up and running. Um, had things, the hostility cooled down in the time that you... In the time we was there, we didn't feel no tension, there was no issues. I'll be quite honest, I know a lot of um, Pakistani um, brethren, a lot of them um, shouted out to me and called out to me and said, listen, it was out of order what happened, This is, we know what happened, we know this. Where this we don't want it to make it look like it was a a, a, um, a, 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 a thing where it was a racial attack kind of thing because everybody in the community knew exactly what happened. Hmm. Even the people them who found out what it was about afterwards who was called and told lies by these people, even they were saying that if they didn't know they wouldn't get involved because So even it, some of the people that rushed the country. Yes, because I know people who have said to me these are Pakistani and guys who have said to me, if they didn't know, they know people who were saying if they didn't know, they wouldn't even uh, have went to the cafe. They was told that this person had been robbed by all the To get them they, angry. And he said to them, listen, come and help me, wear, wear this, and make sure this and that, that, bam. Okay. It's so, too, too late, isn't it? Cafe, yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. don't help yeah. Yeah. So the cafe is uh, up and running. So how long um, did you run the cafe for? Well, um, the cafe ended up closing because I went away hmm. in 2001. Uh -huh. uh, my son was running it for about just over a year. My son owns this property. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where we are now. He ran it for about a year. Yeah. Within that time, they had certain issues um he got fed up of the uh, uh, of of what was going on there and he moved the, he got a cafe up on gave on gave on then uh -huh. at the car, corner uh -huh. and opened it opened it there called the food station mm. um that cafe is still there but it's not the food station somebody else is running it now called the something grill right at the corner mm. and gave on um mm. Road. So I'd say it was open after we opened it. It was open for just probably just over a year. Just be, it closed yeah. just before, just before um, two thousand and two. Yeah, and that was it. Basically, the front line, the last place on the front line was gone. Was gone. Yeah. So two thousand and two. I think the bookies was maybe still open after that. But um, yeah, the, sadly, the Young Lions Cafe closed in two thousand and two. And uh, we're at that situation as we are now on the front line in Lumla, well, the ex front line. No, no meeting place for, for black people in Bradford on Lumla. Well, let me, say, uh, let me say this now. So, here what the problem is. If I. We, we have two places where they call a community centre, or. Checkpoint is supposed to be our a community centre. Mm. Yeah. Then you've got the Dominican Association, which is yeah. going to be a. Yeah. Um, so, the Dominican Club. The Dominican Association, you know, um, what's it called? Worthington Street. Yeah, Worthington Street. Right. Yeah. yeah. So basically, 
So they're the two places that I would say is supposed to be a hub for the community. Hmm. Um, at the moment, I don't know of anything going yeah, on well, in none of them places. It, it's, it's, it's like a lot of people can't don't want to go out at night. If you go out at night, it'd be too o'clock. Hmm. Yeah. And this is this is all the people. You want a daytime thing? Yeah. Uh, yeah, one hundred percent. So there's no there's none of that. That's what there is no. We so need another young lions cafe, basically. Yes, it, well. And not in the center of town because not everyone wants to go center of town, which is where checkpoint is. Yeah. yeah. But I, I I'm not trying to be funny. They won't even want it up a manigan. No. Anyway. Because it's not even yeah. it's not even our community no. And it would be it would just be more out of thing. place. It would have to be. Some I don't me personally, it's um what could I say? By rights, somewhere like checkpoint or the Dominican Association should be supplying something like that. Mm. Because but they're not. But to be like the young lion, somebody's going to have to find some way. To be quite honest, where at we're in the process of actually finding somewhere. It's only about signing on the dotted line. Mm. Um, whether it's going to be like how the young lion used to be is another argument. But mm. it's going to we're going to run it like somewhere that people can come and sit. But down you're the best do. man for it, man. You know what I mean? I don't know if I'm the best man, but well, I'm, well, I'm well, one of the man them who is is passionate about yeah. doing something constructive and yeah. positive for the community. Definitely. And to, and to at least try to have some way because I talk to a lot of people and a lot of people they say listen even from a point of view of the say I think it is no the place is dead mm. Mm. It, it, you know? yeah yeah right so um, so yeah so watch this space and uh, let's see what happens and I'm sure you know Bingy you'll keep us updated yeah so we gone as far as we can with obviously the front line and and everything unless there's anything else you want to add because i wanted to obviously ask other uh, other questions and change the conversation no no no, no that's okay. good that's good um bingy you're a, a jack of all trades <laughs> i got to know bradford jack of all trades yeah, I'm, trying, I'm trying to be a master of some every you know <laughs> you cafe cafe owner Right, pirate radio station owner, sound system you personality, know. music promotion. I mean, nightclub as well. A nightclub yeah, as well. Um, yeah. yeah, and you know, I, that's record why I really producer, record producer, I've been, a, I've been an artist management. I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm still in. Rec I'm still produce music, and I'm still in management. I, I've actually got three artists I manage right oh, now. There from you Jamaica. go. Eastern Community Radio 104.5 FM in stereo by the Asian community for the Asian community. Yes, guys, you're tuned to Asian Paradise Radio 105.5. Much of the Asian Pirates' airtime is devoted to music, everything from film songs to Asian acid house. In between, they also broadcast wedding announcements, readers' letters, competitions, and the Muslim call to prayer. If you can't find what you want on one station, You've got two others to choose from. I listen to the radio all the time. I work from home, I work from here. Um, and because of the magazine, I'm working all hours, you know, middle of the night, um, first thing in the morning, whenever. So um, I always have the radio and it's always an Asian station. Um, you know, it's sort of, I sort of know what's happening in the news, um, who's coming to Bradford, you know, which Bangra albums come out this week, that kind of thing. Bradford, the community of Bradford had absolutely nothing before. You know, they, they wanted something in, in their own mother tongue, which is Urdu or Punjabi, but they had nothing absolutely whatsoever. We had an hour, of, an hour on uh, the legal station, Pennine, but you know, it didn't last long. There was only an hour, it wasn't enough. It didn't cover anything. All you sort of got was a lot of songs and that's it, and the news bulletin, but that's not what people want to listen to. People want to hear what's going on in the community. Between them, the pirates cater for a range of languages, including Urdu, Punjabi and English and a number of religions such as Islam, Sikhism and Hinduism. The pirates' enormous popularity stems from knowing what their audience wants. They recognise that what pleases a schoolboy born in Britain won't necessarily appeal to his Pakistani-born grandfather. 
But the pirates aren't so popular with everyone. There's no evidence that the pirate stations, which are now operating around the sidelines in Bradford, are fulfilling any need at all other than some sort of drive by a few people who are running them who want to broadcast. Um, there is no audience research at all, uh, there is no studio facility, there's nothing at all which you would associate with a radio station. And I would challenge the view that the pirate radio stations are meeting any need at all. Well, one of the reasons for being popular is that there's no other outlets where they could uh, get their music. I mean, over the airwaves, simple as that. I mean, there's no other facilities available in Bradford. This December, the Pirates will face a challenge from a new legal station, Bradford City Radio. In line with the conditions of the IBA licence, BCR will have to serve the diverse Asian communities and Bradford's 10,000 Afro-Caribbeans as well. Even with the best will in the world, can BCR really be all things to all people? What we're offering is a completely alternative service. We're offering information both in English, Hindustani, Gujarati, Urdu, Punjabi. Um, you know, we've got programs catering for the Afro-Caribbean community in terms of plays. We can even get plays coming over in dramas about Afro-Caribbean survival in this country. Um, and also for the Asians. Everything I say, by the way, that you know, for the Afro-Caribbeans or the Asian is actually complementary in some respects because of the, the shared experience within this country, both at a social level and at an economic level. Baby, oh, baby, oh. And do the Afro-Caribbeans who run Paradise City Radio, Bradford's oldest pirate, think their community should have been given its own station? If they'd have done it that way, right? Um, like, give out two licenses, one to the Asians and one to the Asians. It'd have been much better, but the, the radio station what's coming on now, I do, me personally, I don't think they're going to care. Of. A legal station like the one that they've proposed, BCR, I don't think it can fill the gap like PCR can fill the gap, because firstly, it doesn't relate to the people. PCR is made up from people off the streets, and it's for the people on the streets. Minimum requirement is one Asian station. That's the minimum requirement. I mean, we could do with, say, two or three stations in Bradford or in the west of Yorkshire to provide for the West Indians and the Pakistanis and the uh, Indians. I mean, there's uh, different dialects and different languages. The reason why we had to limit uh, the number of stations in any one city to just one is because of difficulties with frequencies. There aren't enough frequencies to go around to satisfy all the demand. So it's a technical reason. In the past, the DTI, which polices the airwaves, has tended to turn a blind eye to the Asian pirates. This is likely to change when BCR starts broadcasting legally, but will the DTI be able to get rid of the pirates? Are they going to get you off air, though? Uh, no chance. They're not going to get us off. Well, not easily. I mean, I can, I can say up to ten raids. If they come and take me off air ten times, I'm, I can go back on air. Maybe the eleventh time is going to be a little, a little difficult for me, but to raid somebody eleven times is a bit difficult. I mean, at the moment, we're, we're a station, we, we don't move about. As you know, I don't know if you know, most of the other stations in Bradford, everyone, every second week, the location has changed. Us, we don't move. We stay in, since the day we've opened, we haven't moved at all. We make it a fact where we are. Because it's for the community. And if the community doesn't know where you are, what good are you to? You know, one of the biggest injustices as well that black people faced was before the mainstream radio stations like Radio 1 and whatever played much reggae music or black music, the pirate radio station phenomenon was very important to the Afro-Caribbean community which started in the early 80s because you couldn't hear your own music on the mainstream radio stations and Bradford um, had its own pirate radio station started by the Afro-Caribbean community and you even helped the Asian community set up theirs. So do you want to go back to, well, I didn't, I, to I, your I, role in that? Let's get it straight. I didn't yeah. help the mm. Asian community set up Hmm. Their radio station, no. Right. We set up the yeah, PCR, Paradise City Radio. Paradise City Radio, yeah. 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 Me and two other people started that. And what year? It was, was that? my brain we had to say, listen, we need to start a, um, a, um, a pirate station in Bradford. Hmm. We got all the equipment, got the contacts, and we got it up and running 
and it was very successful when it started mm -hmm. and it was very popular. What was it, 88, 89? Uh, it's, no, it started in, yeah, back in 87, 88, 88, we got it up and running properly. Okay, and where yeah. did you used to transmit from? Oh, various places. Just used we to didn't, move all over We didn't stay in one place too long, we, okay. we, we <laughs> tried, it was, it, it was important to try to keep us high mm. in Bradford because Bradford is like a, um, a valley. A valley. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's a um, it's a situation where we had to find the places, and so if we found somewhere, we would have to tell the person who was going to come set up the um, equipment, the equipment the to come and actually test there first. Mm -hmm. And then what he would do, he would test the place. Mm. We're using this machine and say, yeah, this is got. We can get a good signal from here. So okay. what we try to do, we find somewhere in Bradford and set up a radio station uh, um, there and then we'd have somewhere on standby because we know that sooner or later you uh, get raided what do you call it, what do you call him again? Um, yeah. oh, D D DPS? D DTS? DTI? DTI, yes. something like that yeah, yeah the, or whatever we, we had to be one step in front of them all the time and then it reached to where we progressed so which was really good the guy one day called us and said listen I've got something for you, it's going to cost money, but I've got some. I said, what? He said, um, you can have your radio station in A and a transmitter in B. Mm -hmm. So basically, the only thing that they will find, if they find it, is the aerial. Right. They won't find all the equipment. They won't find all the equipment. So you must have had enough people and DJs playing the music on Paradise Radio. You know something? Was it was it seven days a week? It was seven days a week, 24-7. And um, it was popular because we had DJs lined up. We did it professional. We had people like Gary G. We had um, um, Mikey, Mikey Roots, Mikey Gemini. Slapness Big Belly Man, as he was known on the on the on the um, thing. I used to play on there. Yeah. We used to, I used to have our um, a lady um, who used to read the news. Yeah. Um, what the, the news as well? Yeah, wow. on the hour, on the hour. <laughs> and um, we used to have, we used to start basically. We was that good that even the the legal radio stations, yeah, I think they put more pressure on us. Because we was that set good at yeah. what we were doing. That DTI was to, I'd say at least every two weeks, we was to get raided. Right, and what was the music policy? Reggae, obviously. It was, we used to play everything, but reggae was the main thing. But you had people like Gary G who used to play soul. Uh -huh. um, you had another um, lady who used to play. Um, Play. She used to play a mixture of everything, whether it be pop, soul, mm. reggae, a mixture of everything. Mm. And then what we did, going back to what you said, with Ali Jan, who was um, he was a DJ, a, um, Pakistani Muslim DJ. He, yeah. We give their process and we give them a slot on the you radio. You stage. gave the uh, members of the Asian community a slot on, on Paradise PCR. Radio. They had a they to make had it a diverse. Slot. They had a slot on PCR and it was very popular as well. Mm. Um, Ali Jan was, was beyond there. He was a um, DJ. And as a matter of fact, he was on the poor uh, office. You know, the poor office, what was on the long, on the, on the, on the long lane? Mm. Uh, next, shop. next door to the bookies. Remember yeah. the poor office? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, he, that's why he, 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 he was one of the DJs who was on the. Um, um, where I call it, so. so they never had their own station, they had slots on Paradise they Radio. A, they, listen, they had a slot on PCR. Hmm. Yeah. And then afterwards, obviously, um, something happened where we had a rumor going around that there was um, a license going to be issued or somebody. A legal to, license yeah. was going to be issued. We were saying that we, if anyone should get it, we should get it. Because you started the radio station. But we never, we, 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 the central, maybe because we didn't really go about it properly, but we didn't get no um, license. You a didn't license, get the license. A license was issued, but we didn't get that. So who license. got the legal license? Um, 
What they call? I'm sure it was know. Bradford City Radio. I just put the call now. Bradford City Radio. I think that's the. I think the, it's them who got the. Um, and who were they? Were they a separate pirate station? No, it wasn't. There wasn't no pirate station. It was just a, a community radio. It's a community radio. And they got the license. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you guys got left out. We didn't. Be, well, I'm not trying to be funny. Almost time, black people start things, and somebody else reads. Yeah, yeah you so were black it. people. Were the, <laughs> black people were the innovators of pirate radio. Well, listen, we, had, we are innovators of many things. Whether it be music, mm. whether it, whether it be the traffic light, whether it, uh, uh, whether it be the railroad, whether it be the telephone, yeah. we are innovators of many many things. But the we, innovators of pirate radio in Bradford who started it and helped the Asian community with the slot, they got left out and it was the Asian community that got the legal license. I'm, uh, I'm not sure if it was um, directly, hmm. because I don't think Bradford City Community Radio is, is just a Asian radio. I'm sure they play other music on there. Yeah. yeah. But the people that started it didn't get their, their, their dues and their um, kind of like what they deserved. Basically, recognition. A regular assault. Yeah. yeah. So, obviously, that's quite sad, but did the pirate radio station still continue to play after that? Well, um, I think the pirate station stayed, it went on until, I'd say, at least 95. Mm. If I'm not sure, well, 94, 95, I think the pirate station mm. went until. Mm. Um, so, and anyone who wants a flavour of what the pirate radio station scene was like in Bradford, PCRS, PCR Radio, Paradise City Radio, there are loads of recordings of shows from the late 80s and the early to mid 90s. If you go on Mixcloud or if you just type in Paradise City Radio Bradford or PCR Radio Bradford, People like Mark Chester on Mixcloud and Jonathan on Mixcloud have recorded a whole heap of the shows, so you can uh, do a little search online and hear some of those recordings. You can hear Bingy, I think your name was Bingy Wonder, wasn't it, on the radio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah playing yeah, some yeah. music as well and yeah, other people. Yeah, yeah. So that's the pirate radio. Um, like I said, you're a jack of all trades. You actually joined the younger generation of Scorcher Sound. Scorcher, which was Bradford's foundation reggae sound system, started in the I think the late 60s in Bradford, you, you became a part of that crew as well, Scorcher Sound System. Yeah, I, um, I started to move around Scorcher Sound in the early 80s. Uh -huh. um, the first time I actually went anywhere far with them was Birmingham, uh -huh. which was a tree sound clash, I think it was Quaker City. Uh -huh. I'm fat man from London and yeah. Scotia, uh -huh. um, which was in Birmingham. <laughs> and um, I just had a love for the sound system. Back in them days, I used to see myself as a, um, a DJ, write lyrics, or microphone, mm. and go on DJ. So, from that point of view, as well as being a person that loved music, mm. and we took over us. Cause we used to call it wasn't the Scotia yeah. song, we call it SRI. SRI. We stand for Scotia Ragamuffin Injection. Right. <laughs> okay. So when we were running it, it was it, it become not just Scotia. Cause one time it was just Scotia, then it was Scotia, and then when we took it, we took we talk it, we call it the SRI. So you started, you joined eighty three, eighty four. Yeah? I'd say that properly. Hmm. I would say yes. Uh, by the time 84, I remember going to Jamaica in 83, 84 to, and I came back with a lot of um, dubs and specials. Okay. Uh, when, as a matter of fact, the first time I went to King Toby Studio uh -huh. was actually to, to cut dub for Scotch. Cut so. dubs. And that, and was, that was about 83, 84. 84. And I'm dying to ask this question. Um, you know, I've asked Rusty so many times, I've asked Rizzler so many times, Bunny, rest in peace, I asked him, what artists did Scorcher Sound System have on special where the artist is saying Scorcher Sound's name on the tune? Well, I can, uh, from my point of view, what I cut, we cut all the of King Kong. King Kong, yeah. Um, I also had 
Um, my name Penny Irie. Penny Irie. I also did um, what you call it? Who, who, who died? One of the um, what's his name? He got shot. Um, it'll come back to me before. Panet. Panet. Yeah. Panet. Power Man. Power Man. Um, King Everell. Uh huh. All those, all those, those King Tubby's artists. All those King T Tubby's artists, all those artists in the 80s. Yeah. I got the whole of them by All of the specials. So, and, and you know something, I don't even know where they are. I want to know where they are. I've been asking Rusty. Yeah, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know where. <laughs> and, and there was a lot of them. Mm. There was a lot of them. And like I said, you think of any artists back in the days mm. who were making the headways in Jamaica in the dance hall scene mm -hmm. and Scotty at them pando because I personally more than one time went out there and caught them. Right. Did, do, do you remember Scorcher having Dennis Brown and Nitty Gritty and all them people? No, I don't know about that because Gre Gregory. I don't I don't know about Dennis because I didn't cut no dub with um, Dennis Brown and uh -huh. I've never cut no dub with Gregory Isaac. Uh-huh. So. Yeah. But you had a whole heap of tunes. So, how long were you with Scorcher? Well, I was with um, Scorcher's song way up until in the late nineties. Late nineties. Going into um two thousand. So just before two thousand. Right. Because uh, we start, we broke away and started our old song called African Wonder. African Wonder. Yeah. Right. So, and I think that happened in about two. I'd say that ninety. Mm. About 98, 99. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're from? Yeah. <laughs> See, popular man. Yeah. But anyway, um, so what, yeah, so you were, when you were with Scorcher, were you the, M were you the MC with the lyrics or were yeah, you the yeah. selector? No, I, 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 I was to do, I was to do, was, Big Belly Man was a main selector. Ah. Uh -huh. Boxer was also a selector. Yeah. I was a mic man, mic man. DJ with microphone, and, and sometimes I hear I hear some cassettes going around, and I shake my head and I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but um, we need with, to find those cassettes. Yeah, and um, yeah, basically was um, my intention at that time was to try to take Scorch sound to another level, mm. because music had changed and the dance hall had changed, and I even talked to um. Big Belly Man uh -huh. um, about actually taking the sound to, to Jamaica. Uh -huh. uh, we didn't have to directly go with physically the sound, but just going with the record box and went to. Because when I go, when I went over there, hmm. I made some good good links. Hmm. The man who used to mix in King Tubby's hmm. and work in King Tubby's is a um, is a youth called Duck Man. Yeah. Um, I made some good links and that's how I got to know King Kong. Yeah. And then I started to manage King Kong. You managed because King Kong lived in Bradford, didn't he, for a while? Well he used to he used to come and stay obviously because he used to live in Basingstoke. Yes. But he used to pass um Bradford all the time because me and him was doing some work yeah. and I was So you, you know, managed King Kong? Yeah, for for wow. uh, um from up until in the in the night about ninety ninety about 90 to about 92, 90. Yeah, about 92. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wicked, wicked. So, and also your music promotions as well. You've been doing music promotions. Yeah, I've been involved in bringing, putting our shows in Pennington's, hmm. which is a Manigam Lane. Okay. That was a big club. Remember them used to call it Mecca? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to put on all the shows in, in Pennington's, and I still bring artists over. The last time, um, well, not the last time, no, but before you come over there the day, because Luciano was over here, but before then, mm. I was one of the last person to bring Lucio over and do a proper UK tour. Wow, wow. And do you still own a nightclub as well? No, I, I used to have a, um, a nightclub in Bradford uh -huh. called Club Icon. Okay. And um, unfortunately, somebody got shot. Yeah. Outside. And they blame That's what the, happens. And, and they blame the club. Well, they didn't. That you know what happened. The um, the person got. It's a long story which I don't want to go about. The person got shot, 
um, who was inside, the two of them was inside there and they got shot from inside and they dropped and died outside. Mm. And they had the key for my club for about five, six months before I actually got the um, So when they got it back, mm. I just watched you. Yeah. We never bother with this. Yeah. So, um, you know, and then I went and got a nightclub in Dewsbury called Crush, uh -huh. which was a completely different genre. Yeah. And I got um, an African guy to manage that. And one day I was in Jamaica, 2010, I think it was. Yeah. I was in Jamaica and I get a phone call from him and said, Oh, police, I've just raided here. And they said that they found about 10 underage under the age of 18 inside there and then took away the license. Okay. Again, you have to pick up the pieces. Well, I just said that's it for me. When it comes to business in England, that's it for me. Yeah. yeah. I just concentrated on, on Jamaica. And if that's not enough, you're also an author of two books. Two published books. I've, actually, published written, books. I've actually written six. You've written six books. But I've had two published books, one called Living a Dream and one called Double Standard, which are, um, are on Amazon. I've got another two books, one called Who Run Things, which is about gangs and mm -hmm. violence. Yeah. And another one, which is called um, White Lies, Black Truths. Okay, so if any of our uh, viewers want to obviously look up your books, um, the author is Richard Bingy Brown, yes? Yeah, that's B I N G I. And author, if you look under that, they, so they, they, the books are they, they're, um, novels basically. So yeah. one is Living the Dream. And what they call Double Standards. Double Standards, okay, and you can get these on Amazon. Yeah, yeah my, uh, my um, writing. I call them, um, you know, like you have fiction. Yeah. But I call my book factions because Fact. what I factions. So yeah. what I what I my writing is faction because what I do, I write all my novels based mm. upon real things, mm. but I turn them into a fictional story. Fiction. But there is some truth in the story. Yeah, and yeah. the characters them in my books are true. Yeah. I just change the names. Okay, and Victor, you obviously have published your photographs as well. Not really published yet, so but in the process uh, of yeah, I've got, I've got the book. Yeah, yeah. And so, will you let us know uh, how you progress with that? I will do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. So that's what we're going to look for. And um, yeah, I mean, so much has been covered. There's so much more we can cover. <laughs> um, you know, um, but um, also. Uh, I set up uh, an interview with both of you guys with Jenny from The Voice newspaper. Uh, Victor, uh, your experience cause of that interview, because I understand that a lot of what you said, uh, was it there or was it missing? I'm surprised that she printed what she did because when I was talking, she kept saying she didn't want to hear that. She uh -huh. didn't want to hear. Uh -huh. She wanted light-hearted stuff. Okay. And, um, so not, not too much serious stuff. Yeah. And <clears throat> she was saying she wants to hear nice things about Bradford City of Culture. Uh-huh. But I was too vexed to... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said... I'm not interested in city of culture because mm. the treatment we got, mm. uh, you know, no, black people, about the tree yeah. and the black people. I, I don't see how I should join in city of culture and that, and and like Bradford is a nice place mm. because it's not been nice to us. We we have nowhere to go. We have nothing. Mm. It's like mm. so you wanted to talk uh, about the past injustices, but yeah, a lot of that which, was left out. Yes. Bingy, you had it worse because. You were interviewed by the journalists, but none of your well, none of your interview was included in the article. Something. I I know that um, she called me, hmm. and I didn't realize it was a an interview because we was talking and it was over the phone. Hmm. 
So obviously she was asking me a certain question because I thought, yes, I know I was expecting a call from the boys. Mm. So I thought they were going to be sitting down and come and be able, obviously she called me and then she was just talking to me, um, where you call it. And that's when I realized that it was at the actual interview, which was over the, yeah. uh, did, she, did she do she that over the phone? Yeah, she didn't let me know it was an interview. Yeah, okay, so basically. Yeah, so basically, yeah, so basically, and obviously, if somebody's coming and talking to me, I'm just going to be truthful in my opinions and truthful with my issues or mm. truthful in what I spoke from my point and seeing things. So mm. Mm. obviously, I was talking and I was telling it as I see it and as yeah. and it has been. But none of it was included. Well, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes, sometimes words, words, sometimes words are even worse than the pen, you know? mm, Yeah, yeah, true. But uh, yeah, so if anyone wants to see the voice article, um, I mean, I mean, I was I was harassing the voice for time, you know, getting them to do this article about Bradford and the past injustices. So if anyone wants to check it out, it was. We're still in August, aren't we? So it's in this month's edition of The Voice, August 2023. All you have to do is go on Google um, News and, and type in Bradford Afro-Caribbean and Voice newspaper and you'll see an article which is available online called Bradford, The Invisible Community. And it talks about uh, 2025 and Bradford. So that leads us on nicely to the next question and <laughs> you know I have to keep a straight face <laughs> when I ask this question bearing in mind all the bad things that have happened to black people in Bradford um, Victor Bradford recently has been voted the UK City of Culture 2025 how excited are you about that? Well like I said you know when I was being honest to the newspaper machine, um, The Voice, mm. and I, I was saying, well, like I said, I'm not interested, I wasn't interested, um, because we have nothing, we have, well, what we know, what I know of black people in Bradford was mainly the front line, people from all over Bradford gravitate to the front line, and it's not there. They were saying you we would like to replace it, not the same place obviously. We would like somewhere that operates the same way. Yeah, a daytime meeting place. Yes. Yeah. We don't have to um, go into the centre of town. Yeah. And obviously it's not gonna be in a residential area because we play music. Black mm. people play music. A lot mm. of people don't, especially the the, the majority of um, in Bradford. They don't want music. Mm. So because of who we are, we want somewhere where we can play our music, go and play a game of pool, play some domino. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Reason and talk. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's something like the Young Lions Cafe, which uh, which is missing. So um, you don't think that Bradford 2025 and winning the City of Culture is going to benefit you one at all? I can't see anything how. to get excited about. Oh, I can't think what. No. No. Okay, Bingy. Bradford has won the City of Culture 2025. How excited were you when you heard that news? Did you have to stop the car and jump up and down? <laughs> well, let me, let me put it like this. Let's say that my view on Bradford being a city of culture is that if you think about the word culture and the, Bradford is diverse, and it has got many cultures, so it could be called the city of culture. My take on it, but is it a fair distribution of what cultures should be given within 
this city of culture? And my answer is that when it comes to we as the Afro-Caribbean community, black community, I don't think that we have had, or could I say this, a fair bite at the big cake that gets distributed. Who gets most of it in Bradford? Well, if I was to say who gets most of it, my question is all you have to do is Google and see who is the most populated within Bradford and that would be my answer. Mm. And at the end of the day, if you have to look at it from a point of view, if you drive around Bradford right now, you will see who is more... The majority ethnic minority. Yeah, if you, if you really go around and look and you, you can see who is thriving in this, in this and it's definitely not... The Afro-Caribbean community. No, 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 no. That's from my point of view. Somebody yeah. else might have a different view and as far as I'm concerned I'm entitled to my opinion and my opinion is of course. it's not our community no. and to say that we've been here from in the 1950s you would expect us to maybe maybe we have to take some of the responsibility because there's a saying it's the inactions of those who should have acted the indifference of those who should have known better and the silence of the voice of justice when it matters the most which has kept us as black people where we are in certain communities. And in, until people start to act and until people start to talk and until people who know, who know the um, difference act on what they know then that's the only time that we are going to be able to thrive. If you look anywhere where you want to look, we always seem to be at the bottom of the chain. And that is the truth. Mm. If anybody wants to deny that, it's because they are not, they're not seeing it from the views of what it's supposed to be seen from. Reality is reality. We've all got our opinion, mm. but the truth still remains the truth. Yeah. And the truth is, when it comes to Bradford anyway, as a city of culture, I need somebody to come and tell me from uh, Afro-Caribbean culture, black culture, tell us what we have in Bradford and what we have been given in Bradford. And don't come and tell me about the wind rush. But I don't know if it's lack of trying. How can it be lack of trying when all these black businesses are closed? Well, listen, let me tell you this. This is how I look at it. If, if you have... The, I have always been entrepreneurial. Yes. Nobody can stop me from trying. Nobody can stop me doing what I want to do. And I'm saying, mm. I have been through a whole heap of fight. I have been all the um, struggle. But it still hasn't stopped me from doing what I want to do. We are known to go through struggles. Yeah? We have been through 400 years of slavery. And then after coming out of this so-called slavery, we've been put in another slavery. 100 odd years we've going through this. Yeah? It's up to us now to start making sure that we get what we are supposed to get, we do what we want to do, do what we need to do to make our communities survive. And if we can we can always sit back you know, and watch others surviving and complain. But until we say, well, F this, we have to get up and stand up and fight. In Bob Marley say, what did he say? Get up, stand up. You have to get up and you have to stand up. The difference with a lot of people who do not want to talk, and this is why His Majesty Emperor Ayala Selassie said, it's the inactions of those who should have acted, it's the indifference of those who should have known better, and it's the silence of the voice of justice when it matters the most, but makes evil persist, persist and survive. 
and it's injustice that persists and survives mm -hmm. from our case. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we know better, we should do better. And if we know better, then we have to fight for the better. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I always say, let's not sit down and wait for people to come and hand out our riches. Don't let's sit down and wait for people to come and give us somewhere. We have to go out there and we have to get it. We have to. Mm. We have to. Because if not, we won't get it. Mm. I've, heard, I've heard this conversation. Yeah? That even most recently with the certain talk of being bounced around where they were saying, listen, you can't blame certain members of the community for thriving and being enterprise and having their businesses because they go out and they go for it and they are entrepreneurial the black people have also got to be listen if you look in the uk all right then from another point of view before we go i don't know how long we've got yeah. name me how many million black millionaires you know in Bradford who you can look and say that's one, that's one, that's one, that's one, that's one. How many black billionaires can you name when you can say that's one, that's one, that's one, that's one, that's one? In the UK. Oh, yeah. Don't don't yeah. let's not talk about no sports. <laughs> Please don't mention sports no, or music. Not. We're talking about people who are in business who you can look and say that's a businessman, that's a businessman, that's a businessman, that's a businessman. Not many, I don't know many. I know a couple, but what I'm trying to say, they are not in your face. Yeah. But yet still you can name from other parts of the community, of different parts, sections of the community, who you know they are millionaires. Mm. Look at Abbas. He come from nothing. Look at his success. Mumta's successful business. Mm. Khan's, who is a car business, successful business. Then you've got white businesses, you've got Polish people who are coming into Bradford and they're getting so sick. Mm -hmm. Romanian who are coming into Bradford and they're getting so sick. We have to be more entrepreneurial and not depending on people to come and do anything for us. Mm. Sometimes it's not made easy for us. No. It's not, the, 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 mm. the, there's no so, so this Bradford City of Culture 2025, it's not, going, it's not really going to provide any benefits. Well, I'm not going to say that it's not going to until I see from, how long is it the city of culture for? I think, I don't know, it's a few years, isn't it? Is it, is it every, whatever years it's the city of culture for, so after it goes to somebody else, ask me that question. If I see any the city, changes. If I see any changes within, yeah. anything, anything which is beneficial and mm -hmm. enterprising, yeah. to the Afro-Caribbean community. Well, guys, time flies. <laughs> I, like, like the other interview, I've been... I haven't... You know, hardly moved. <laughs> you know, since you know I, mean? I haven't had no lunch. You know, <laughs> I mean, I've just basically been... You know, I, I've been besotted by what you guys have told me. The time has gone so quick. Such a powerful, interesting interview. Um, I want to thank you guys for your time, you know, taking the time to come to Leeds as well. You know what I mean? It's just kind of, it's amazing. And um, I always ask this question at the end, but I think you've probably already said what you wanted to say. Is there any parting message for the people that are watching, first of all, Victor? Just keep trying. Keep trying keep and trying. never give up. Yeah, don't give up. And uh, Bingy, I think you've said everything. I'm going to just say this again since you're asking me. It's the inactions of those who should have acted. It's the indifference of those who should have known better. And it's the silence of the voice of justice when it matters the most. What keeps we in the position we are today. And until people start acting, and it's until people start knowing better, and doing better and until people start talking when they're supposed to talk and don't let's not water wash it down don't don't gloss over it don't try to speak what people want you to speak because you want to say a face just talk it as it is mm. simple as that brilliant well yeah big respect and honor uh, for all your 
for all your thoughts today, gentlemen, uh, Victor Wedderburn and Richard Bingy Brown. Victor, let us know when the book is out. I will do, yeah. Uh, Bingy, let us know when you find the place. I want to film inside the place. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And, and, and you know something, before I go, I, I, I need to say this because I don't like when there's certain narratives going around. Dexter Coleman's killing had nothing to do with drugs. Yeah. People need to get that. And let me tell you this, the true may hurt, but it's not an offence. And there's opinions but there's only one truth and the truth is the truth okay well dexter coleman rest in peace blessed and thank you guys once again god bless peace most of the big quest going out to city banton also jason be fresh to my brother them younger brother than myself you know Just release from penitentiary. Good to have you about once again. Sweet sounds of coke tea. Say keep on doing it, walk away from the songs of coca tea. Into my singer for last year, must be my singer for this year. I'm to book up on this man last night in Birmingham, and may I tell you, say, this one is my singer, Trilla You. I think entitled Kielos Whisper, Whisper and His Wickedness. This one available on the Redman Superpower Record label. Check it out, live stop non stop. Oh, yeah. I'm not telling you in a studio.